my clock, well, one of my clocks says six. So um, I'm going with that, okay. Um, we came to order at the beginning of the budget training uh, for five when a quorum of board members came present. So uh, let me welcome the, uh, the board members who were not able to attend the budget training session and also members of the public. Thank you very much for, for coming and joining us. Um, the first item after reception of guests and um, I guess, you know, we're all guests in a way, um, would be agenda revisions. Um, now, I should point out as we go into this that ordinarily um, in past meetings, we've had a 3.3 .3 public comments. I should just explain that the, um, that the agenda setting committee um, by consensus decided that we would have not the public comments at the beginning of the meeting, but hold them for the end of the meeting. So if you're wondering where public comments are, um, they're agenda item eight now. Um, so uh, board members, you control the agenda. So if you have agenda revisions, please let me know. Raise hands or um, Lindy. I'd just like an uh, explanation about moving the public comments to the end. Since people have been coming at the beginning and we never know when the end will be. I'm curious about that. Um, I think, uh, and, and I will invite my colleagues on the agenda setting committee to, um, to augment my explanation if I, if it's um, if I'm not getting it all, but I think the sense was that, um, you know, in line with the, uh, the old saw that it's, um, it's a board meeting in public, not a public meeting with the board, um, that the proper place for public comments would be at the end. Um, do, uh, is that a pretty good summary, um, Jonas? Yeah, so we had been had, because of the high number of public comments that we've been receiving since the beginning of the year, we made the decision to have public comments both at the beginning and the end of the meeting. And we didn't want to uh, you know, remove any opportunity for public comments um, until that sort of volume of public input started to go down a little bit. Right, which it did, you know, in the last couple of meetings, we haven't had, you know, nearly the, the number of people coming and talking. Um, we also had this budget training and next time we're going to have the budget forum at the beginning at the beginning of the meeting. Um, you know, all of, you know, both of those, you know, with, you know, included opportunities for you know, anyone to, to speak up. Um, so, you know, our, the decision was, do we want public comment at the beginning or the end? Uh, and we decided to go at the end of the meeting. Um, for, you know, the reasons that Scott just said. You know, Flora, Diane, uh, Jill, you know, jump in if, if that's yeah. not your understanding. Yeah, sure. and I would say also, we, we've been talking about this for a couple of meetings. We, we didn't just do it. We, we actually referenced it at the last couple of meetings that this was coming. So this is, shouldn't be the first time people are seeing it or mm -hmm. realizing it. Uh, Fleur and then Caroline. And, and one thing to add is that we felt like to engage with the public, we needed to make it meaningfully. So, so we are part of our norms and part of what we're trying to do is to provide more opportunities like we've done in the past for the COVID update for the public to be able to engage in a more meaningful way with the board and our superintendents. So that was the, the other part of it. And, and we really have a lot of work to get done. So otherwise it makes our meetings uh, sometimes not able to get all of the work that we need to get done for the public. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Um, 
what I had to say is about 3.2 agenda revisions, but I don't want to cut anybody off of the public comment so, discussion. Um, we're, uh, at anything further agenda revisions is fair game. Okay, um, I just wanted to say on 4.4.4, substitute rate of pay and action, um, I'm going to have to abstain from the conversation and the vote. So I'm going to just block my video and just not vote. So I won't say yes or no, because there is no abstention. I just wanted to clarify that ahead. So we don't have to go over it when it comes up, because I'm hoping it will be a really fast paced discussion and meeting. Thank you for that. Um, any other uh, any other board member agenda revisions, um, whether it's discussion of the place of public comments or anything else that's on the agenda? I'm, I'm not seeing anything. So um, let us then move to Towns and Anna. Um, I do believe they're here. We are. Hello. Hi. Um, I guess to kick off the student report, um, last week uh, parent-teacher conferences were held, so there was no school on that day, and then also um, there was time for parents to meet with uh, their children's teachers over Zoom. Um, and, and they, they, they went pretty well. Uh, clubs are also starting to come together a lot. Um, I'm on the yearbook committee and we've started to bring out pictures, um, as well as, uh, Chronicle is really getting going and we're starting to publish things. And I know that uh, Seeking Social Justice, the, uh, the social justice organization, the Social Justice Club, uh, also uh, has started meeting again. Um, next week is Thanksgiving, which means there will only be two days of school. Um, and uh, we'll, you know, have a, have, a, have a nice long Thanksgiving break. As well as all of that, there was the middle school math carnival, which has been a tradition for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yes, middle schoolers design uh, games of chance to play with each other, and then uh, uh, go around spending tickets uh, and play each other's games. Um, yeah, and that's that's what's been happening at school. Are there any questions? Yeah, games of chance. Is there yeah. a gambling <laughs> going on in the establishment? Yes. Our middle school math class, uh, Towns, I believe when you were younger, you did it too. They yes. give us all these supplies. I believe they give us a certain amount. We have to build some form of game and uh, yeah. go around and it's, you just try to win all the games. And it's, it's like for a probability. Yeah, it's a, it's a probability thing where you're supposed to design a game with a certain probability of winning, um, and then every uh, you know kid or team designs their own game, and <laughs> no actual money is gambled. <laughs> right, probability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it sounds fun. Sounds good. I guess any, one more thing any other board uh, we're finally starting to get grades together on canvas which is a big relief for me personally to be able to see my success and everything so. that's great um other board member questions for towns thank you very much to you both and and um Wish you a, a good short week next week and a wonderful holiday um, during which you don't see anybody you don't ordinarily see every day. <laughs> so I hope that's fun. <laughs> um, 
Wonderful. So, uh, superintendent report, Brian. Thank you, Scott. And uh, I have to say, uh, following up Anna and Towns, it's always tough because they have so much energy, but I, I feed off their energy too. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate them both. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, I have a, a number of things to talk about in my uh, 4.2.1 uh, COVID-19 update. Uh, just to first uh, say that the uh, just recent, just as of yesterday, the Department of Health uh, had sent uh, me an email uh, praising our district, our, uh, our district leadership, the Board of Ed, and our leadership team for uh, continuing to ensure that our children have opportunities to come to school each and every day. Uh, and they do recognize that it's getting, it's more difficult because there's a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety around what's happening uh, just right in our own backyards and, and with throughout Washington County and Vermont with the rise in case numbers. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just wanted to share that. It was, an, it was actually nice to get a, a little, uh, you know, a little email from the DOH saying, hey, uh, you, know, you know, keep up the good work and, uh, you know, please let their, your leadership team know how much they appreciate, uh, how much their efforts are being appreciated at the state level. Uh, that being said, uh, I think it's also important that, um, you know, we're following the state guidance and uh, we've been very cautious in following the state guidance. I think we operate out of an overabundance of caution. Um, to, and and as, as your superintendent of schools, I just want to go on record to, to let everyone know that, yes, I do say we're following state guidance. I do say that uh, we're implementing the precautions and making sure we uh, follow our, and work well with the Department of Health. However, uh, if I feel that need as your superintendent to, uh, to make additional things happen in order to guarantee the safety of our students and staff, uh, I'll, I'll be more, I will do that uh, with, with support or without support from uh, the state folks because that's how, I, that's how strongly I feel about it. So I just wanted the public to know that. Uh, you know, the, uh, I want the, uh, our te teachers to hear that and I want the, uh, our parents and students to understand that as well. Uh, that this is, uh, you know, it's something I, I understand that as your superintendent, that, uh, I, that the great responsibility that I have. And while the ultimate goal it, is to keep our children in school, uh, if it has to come to the fact that we can't do that, then we're not going to do that. Uh, just, just, and as uh, just a little bit prior to our board meeting tonight, uh, the, the next update is. Uh, we did get a uh, positive uh, case uh, at co of COVID uh, at U32 uh, just a little bit before this um, board meeting tonight. And I just want to, we are working with the, the, the Department of Health with U32 administrative team uh, has been working extremely hard in this case. And I believe uh, we're going to, we're still going to be able to keep the uh, school open, but there are going to be some, uh, uh, folks who have been contacted and will uh, will not be uh, uh, be able to come to school. I don't know if Principal uh, Stephen has any anything else to add on that part. I mean, we just literally been working on this prior to the meeting. So, yeah, well, yeah, we're we're still working on it right now. But um, we have one pod in our middle school that will have to quarantine, um, and then a couple of other students. But it looks like our precautions are keeping us from having to have too many people out and too many. Um, uh, students or teachers out. So we think we're, we're pretty good um, uh, so far, but we're certainly contacting families right now to let them know about this, both by email and uh, we're talking to them directly on the phone. So we're actually doing that as we speak. So live from U32 right now. <laughs> thank you, Stephen, and thank you, U32. And, uh, and I think the idea here is uh, when you look at these uh, things, when they happen, you get recommendations uh, from the Department of Health uh, and again, uh, they may say, they may say, you know, consider for 24 hours, you know, this is what you should consider, but ultimately the, it, it falls, it falls on us uh, at my, it falls on me, uh, in consultation with, uh, principal Steve and his team and our, um, department of health. And so just so you're aware, so we're, we're going to do those precautions, not just for tomorrow, but for the rest of the week for that pod. So it won't just be a 24 hour thing you know, tomorrow. Let's just make sure everyone's safe and do that for uh, Thursday and Friday. Okay. Yep. Um, Brian, sorry to interrupt you. Um, 
just one question. I, it all sounds as though everyone is doing the right thing. Um, I'm just interested. Uh, who is doing the contact tracing? Is it U32 or it, it is the state? They're not the asking state. you because I, I I saw the article about on um, the state asking school contact tracing. And, yeah. Um, I'll let Steve and talk to you. Yeah, so, um, so Scott and board members, um, we have uh, the, the word that we got from the state and we had it clarified a couple of days ago was that uh, we're not conducting the contact tracing. We're just notifying people of quarantine and things like that. They feel like the, the school has better contact initially with families to be able to communicate that. But the uh, health department is the one who does the contact tracing. And we've already been on the phone several times with them um, so uh, they're they're getting that process started as well. Thank you, uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Scott. Are there any other questions about this uh, particular thing, or should I continue, Jonas? Uh, is the state is the state making it clear to you know everyone who's been you know contact traced and everyone in in that pod who's quarantining? Is the state making it clear and making it easy for them to access testing? And is there anything that we can do as the district to make it easier or make it more available for those people who are affected to get tested? I guess that might be a question for Elizabeth. Well, I can tell you though, actually, because we were just talking. Um, so I'm, I can't be 100% sure what the state says when they make a phone call, but I can tell you that we include information uh, about uh, when you can start testing um, because there is a delay from when you're exposed. Elizabeth can be much more specific about that, but um, we're including the information about how to get testing and where it's available um, in the area so that our families can make that decision should they choose to. Thanks. Anna? Um, this is for Stephen and Brian, I guess. Is school, should it be going on as normal? Even yes. with this positive case, everything should be normal? Yes. Uh, yes, I can have Stephen talk more about it, uh, but uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the precautionary uh, model that the U32 administration had developed in the time of reopening uh, back in uh, July and August seems to be working. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think, you know, that precautionary guidance was developed so schools could do what we're doing now, which is quarantining certain folks and allowing the school to continue to remain open. Stephen, do you have anything else? No, I think we've learned a lot about um, first primary contacts and secondary contacts. And so there are very few primary contacts um, here in the school because of our pods. And so the rest of the students should be safe and, and healthy. And as long as we keep wearing the masks, keeping our distance and washing our hands, uh, <laughs> and, and of course not being in any multifamily gatherings and um, not having any fun whatsoever, we're good. <laughs> Thank you. Jonas. Sorry, just one more quick question. You may not know this or you may not be able to tell us, but do you know if this case was was contracted at school or outside of school? I, I don't I can't answer that question. Uh, so I don't I don't know, Stephen. We we are we're clear that the contact was not here in the school for where the uh, student contracted it. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions before we let Brian move on? Um, Anna, your hand is still up. Is that, um, you're, you're good? Okay, Brian. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so the, uh, the other big thing moving along here is I did meet with the leadership team uh, recently and we did talk about the early release days that, were, that did happen uh, in, in November. Uh, and I would like the board uh, to consider adding additional early release days th through the month of December for our, for our elementary and middle school teachers. Uh, and the following dates would be December 2nd, December 9th, and December 16th. And uh, let me explain why. All right. So uh, first of all, there were some instructional shifts that needed to take place uh, to support remote learning. Uh, they needed some time to make the shift. Uh, and if I think we want to continue to make progress uh, during remote learning, if we have to go to remote learning, uh, we need to make time to make that progress. Uh, now, the second 
piece is we need to ensure that all families have access and understand how to fully utilize Canvas in order to, to support student learning. Uh, the third thing is our teachers have expressed gratitude for this time, and many have been asking their principals for additional time to prepare in case we do need to go remote. So, uh, so th these uh, two days that we had were several hours, uh, but we they would need some more time, uh, and uh, th they also need to work on their the, getting their the remote infrastructure uh, fully prepared with the support staff who might not have good internet access at home in the event that teachers have to work primarily or exclusively from their homes. And uh, last but not least, today was November 18th. It was a half day. Uh, uh, prior to when the board approved today, one of the other things is we did not know that today would also be the day that we would be conducting surveillance testing of our entire staff. So uh, that came up last week. We were notified from the, from the Department of Health and the Agency of Education about this opportunity to do this. And Wednesday was the day uh, and we were doing a lot of a surveillance testing. And, and I, I know Elizabeth, I, I, I'm, I, I don't see, I see Elizabeth somewhere up there. She's a, I'm surprised she's not slumped over falling asleep right now because she has done just an amazing job trying to coordinate this in such a short amount of time. But I also know that teachers had this, had to, who, who uh, participated in this today um, were, um, What's the word? Uh, you know, this is supposed to be a half day to help work with preparing for remote, but I know a lot of them were getting tested. They were they were conducting. The there was other things that were happening as a result of today. So we really want to be able to give the teachers um, some more opportunities to have the early release on December second, 9th, and sixteenth. So Brian, um, do we have a motion to that effect be brought to the board at this point? Yeah. Um, would would a board member care to make that motion? I do it by saying so moved. <laughs> <laughs> right. <I'll second>. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, as I understand it, the so in that moved uh, refers to early release, approval right. of early release on December 2nd, 9th, and 16th. Is that correct? For, for elementary and middle school. Oh, for elementary for and middle elementary school. And Middle school, right? Thank you. Important detail. Um, thank you. You you captured it so much more elegantly with that. So, Jill, um, so <laughs> I couldn't remember all I, the details. <laughs> <laughs> um, any board discussion? Okay, then. Uh, oh, um, uh, Chris. Yeah. Uh, hey, Brian. Um, hey. Do you? anticipate that uh, there'll be requests for more early release days um, and, or that it should be just included as a, a matter of course. And the reason I'm asking that is that just to give parents enough forewarning and notice if, if, we, if you think that this is something that will continue on into the, into the new year so that people can plan around it. Yeah, great question, Chris. I appreciate you asking it. The, uh... Uh, the, the way I've been looking at it is I think we got to do it on an as needed basis. I think some districts have made that call to do it throughout the entire year. Uh, I don't think that's ne necessarily what we what we need to do uh, right now. Currently, uh, we're trying to uh, see what our teachers need and make this really like a need based uh, situation for our folks. Um, so, you know. The question is, should we just do it for the rest of the year, make Wednesdays early release, and I, and I or make it for several weeks at a time? And I, and I think right now we're chunking it, you know, right now in November and now December. I can't really speak to if that's going to continue because we're we're working on it for uh, on an as needed basis. So uh, I see that I see that I do know I've had parents reach out to me asking if that's what we're doing. It's a similar question, uh, and I, and I think the answer is. I don't want to commit to doing it for the rest of the year or for a longer period of time, but we could be prepared to do that uh, if our teachers really need that uh, extra time. Thanks, um, Jael, and then Floor. You may have um, gone over this, Brian, but um, is this going to impact um, when students get out in the summer? No, uh, no, it will not. Um, we're uh, we're. Uh, we're on pace. We're, 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 we've had school every day this year so far, knocking on wood, right? Uh, we've been able to keep the schools open. Uh, so no, the answer is no, not at this time. 
Thanks. Floor? Should we should we make a make the motion to give you the ability to make those decisions in a need basis instead of having to come back to the board since it's something that you coordinate with the leadership team and the kids and then you come back to the board to inform and not count on our mm -hmm. meetings it just because through COVID, you know, and then it would give you more flexibility because you would understand the needs of your staff. I, I'm just I'm yeah. not saying that's what we should do, but it might give you more flexibility without having to wait for a board meeting to take that action. And you can always inform us via email because you know mm -hmm. we don't coordinate operations, right? Well, it just thought. It's an interesting idea, Floor. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I think it would be great that if you, if the board wants to authorize that to me, I can definitely do that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the thing is, and if you don't want to do it for the entire, maybe if you want to do it for the months of January and February, and Kate, and then I can re-ask it if it's necessary at that point. That's something to consider. Oh. I, I, I guess I would be willing to to do that. You know, we could take this motion. Uh, you know, table the motion on going on right now as an option. I don't, I don't want to do what you're doing, Scott, but if, if there was interest from the board just as part of discussion, we could give him, at least through the winter, be my suggestion, uh, without really having talked to anybody about this. So I'm, I'm just brainstorming with you guys. It just feels like it would be cleaner and, and give them more flexibility to adapt to the needs of the staff. Do you want to make a friendly amendment to my motion? Is that allowed, Scott? Allowed. Yeah. So to to take the dates out. So just do a friendly amendment from uh, from November eighteen through March thirty first. I don't know. Does that make is that yeah. good enough, Brian? So that gets you through the end of the winter and the third quarter, and so, then we will assess things for the fourth quarter. So uh, authorizing the superintendent to. I just want to put a few limits on it. So would we be authorizing the superintendent to um, to choose as many as uh, three days for early dismissal for elementary and middle school per month? I, I don't think that we- I don't know. I'm just like, like, or do we want to leave it totally open? I, I, I guess I'm open to it. I just wasn't sure what you were proposing. I, I think we leave it open to okay. to, to him to, to figure out with the staff and the leadership team on what they they need, if it ends up being every Wednesday or not, and they don't really, they can come back to inform us, but they don't have to continue to do this. That that's just how. Okay. how it so, it, uh, authorize the superintendent for to do early release as needed from okay. number eight, November eighteenth through the March thirty first. Just at that. Okay. Um um, just to make sure that we don't we don't get uh, lost in this, has just suggested that friendly amendment. Um, and Jill, as the I'm good. Um, you you're good with it. Um, and uh, just make sure that Lisa was able to get that. Sorry. Uh, so I have that. Jill moved to authorize the superintendent to create early release dates as needed from November 18th, 2020 through March 31st, 2021. Yes. That sounds good. Okay. So that is the motion that we're considering now and that we're discussing. And um, first Jonas and then Lindy. Uh, I don't think anyone seconded that. I will do that at this point. Um, I don't see any reason, if we're going to do this, I don't see any reason why we should put an end date of March 31st on it. It's not going to be over by March 31st. I'd say we just give it to the end of the year. Sounds good. That's fine with me. Okay, now we have a friendly amendment to the friendly <laughs> amendment. <laughs> we're so friendly around here tonight. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, Lisa, um, just wanting to make sure that... Um, uh, Jonas proposed a friendly amendment to Laura's friendly amendment to Jill's original motion that Jill or have accepted. Um, we're, wherever we are. Um, got that, Lisa? Yeah, so through the end of the school year versus March 31st. Through the end of the school year. Okay, so that is now the motion that 
were that's before us. Um, and uh, Jonas, having um, did you have any more to say, or should no. Lindy? I would like okay. the word. I would like the word Wednesday in there. You've just given him he could do early releases Monday through Friday till the end of the year, and I just think it'd be good to have in the motion Wednesdays. Um, I thought I saw Anna coming out with a cheer, <laughs> but but she's in high school, so it wouldn't affect her anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, do we now have heard? friendly amendment um are, are we uh are we all are we all good with the wednesdays is, i mean is um, there something Jonas? urgent about wednesdays or or could we say once a week no wednesdays um, because it already a, is Brian. okay yeah. wednesday matters. i think wednesdays are important yeah well, yeah. well uh yeah, let brian so so i think wednesdays would be important. Uh, I, what's interesting is this new surveillance testing um, thing that we did today has, uh, I don't wanna say is thrown a wrench into how we do this, but we were able to get surveillance testing on Wednesday to this past this week, right? But they're gonna continue to ask us to do this every four weeks. Uh, they're gonna do 25% of the state every week moving forward. In, I think in perpetuity throughout the year. So. There may be a, I mean, I, I would be most likely shooting for Wednesdays, but there could be a, if the state came in and said, we're going to do surveillance tests and the kits are on their way, we're mailing them in on, I mean, I would request Wednesdays, right? But let's say if they said they can only get it to you for Tuesday for some reason, I don't know. That, that might be, I don't know, but maybe we're overthink, maybe we're overthinking this. Elizabeth has her hand up too. Maybe she can comment more on this. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't it. see Elizabeth. Please. I didn't see what this was Yeah, so go ahead. The, the testing, we did 200 people today. That was pretty good, 202 staff. And um, it only takes a moment for staff to do it. So I don't think that it has, it, it doesn't have to be a day off to do it or anything like that. They can fit it into their day pretty easily, I think. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. I think it's great that we can do it. And I think we'll, we'll take whatever they'll give us for time. Okay. And Wednesdays, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Lindy, did you have anything more? No, I was going to say exactly what Elizabeth said. We did it in Essex on Monday with um, quite a few people. And I think Wednesdays is what families understand has been our early release day anyway. And to just willy, willy nilly, because I think it would be willy nilly if we decide, oh, the COVID testing is next week on Thursday, let's make it Thursday, would throw a wrench in people's schedules. I think you have to stick to the Wednesdays. Okay, so, and that is indeed the motion that is before us. Chris, is that your hand up? Um, it, it was, but then based on what just happened, it's now with, taken down. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, um, is there any more discussion or shall we go to a vote? Stephen is trying to talk. Uh, uh, oh, Stephen, look. Yeah. Stephen, look. I, I had my hand. Um, I had sorry. my hand. I'm sorry, Stephen. You're on my page two for some reason. So um, yeah, that's, that's fine, Scott. My I'm apologies. Lucky I'm, I'm lucky I'm on any page. It's just I'm not sure what <laughs> page I'm on. Um, and I, I, I offer this, suggesting that it doesn't need to be part of the motion, but I want to be mindful of what Chris brought up at the beginning of the discussion and what Lindy brought up about Wednesdays. And um, again, I don't think it needs to be part of the motion, but the superintendent understand from the board that we want the families to provide, be provided with the maximum amount of prior warning um, for these days. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, uh, and I see Brian has taken note. Uh, so, uh, any other board member that I'm, I'm not seeing, my apologies again, um, if not, we can go to a vote on the motion as originally moved by Jill, seconded by Floor, friend, uh, amended in a friendly manner, then by Floor, 
Jonas and uh, Lindy. Um, and they record, and it's by Lisa. Um, so what we're looking at is early release date, authorize the superintendent, Claire, um, and on his early release on Wednesdays um, of the year. As is, needed. Is that, is that as, as needed? Thanks. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Perfect. All in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay. I see um, this vote. Very good. The motion. So um, many thanks, everyone. Brian, back to you. Great. Uh, also, uh, just to let the board know, got some good news. Uh, some good news. Just so uh, we were able to, I was happy to sign a uh, document from the uh, AOE uh, that we were receiving $80,000 uh, from a grant. Uh, just uh, so that this is a grant is a part of the coronavirus relief fund for child nutrition equipment reimbursement. So uh, uh, we're going to get some money from, uh, from one of our, uh, from our grants. So this is a, uh, Eighty thousand uh, dollars for food programs. We've also received a fifty thousand dollar grant earlier, uh, about several weeks ago. So, so right now we've received one hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars in grant money for food programs. And I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Lori for her leadership in uh, helping secure this money. Uh, so, some good news. Definitely. Thanks to you. Thanks to you both, Brian and Lori. Thank you. Uh, continue. Okay, so the uh, next piece of, of it is the uh, our uh, continuing uh, journey through central office job descriptions. Uh, that is uh, on page ten of your packet, four point two point two. This these are the uh, job descriptions that for all the folks that work underneath the business administrator. Uh, so these uh, positions are folks that we already currently have in our in our school uh, in our school district these are not additional positions or anything like that it's just redoing their job descriptions again which have not been done in many many a long long time uh so and uh we're just doing them so i'm asking you to approve them for tonight and then i think uh, we'll uh, continue the job descriptions until we end up getting them all and then at some point i would like to show the board a table of organization so you have an idea of what that looks like and then you'll have these job descriptions so you everyone will have a very good idea of what everyone does that is one of the projects that we've been doing this year fantastic thanks brian so uh, and this might be a place to entertain a motion to approve the job descriptions and then we can discuss them would anyone care to make such a motion? So, so move the job descriptions as a slate. There's like five of them. I don't have the names right in front of me. Four. Four, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, it seems like five or even more. <laughs> okay, um, so floor has moved. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Jaya. Okay, floor is moved, Jaya is seconded. Yeah. Um, questions? Um, Brian? Yeah, I just want to say up. that th this is a, has been quite a project. Uh, there's been a process uh, and a very intentional process when we do these. We take the old job descriptions. We sit down with the folks that are doing the jobs. We ask them to re review it. We then compare them to similar types of jobs that are in the state of Vermont. We also then have the supervisor, uh, in this case, Lori, uh, look over the job descriptions. We do sort of several, I don't wanna say revisions, but updates throughout the process. And this is something that we started back in early as July. Uh, so I'm very happy that we're uh, here with this piece now. That's great. 
Thanks. And Stephen, look, I'm happy to see you on my page one now. Congratulations. Um, oh, thanks. Maybe. Um, so I view this as unnecessary to come before the board for approval, and it would, in my mind, falls under the board micromanaging um, what's going on. Uh, I'll speak for myself. I'm not gonna spend any time reading job descriptions uh, that Brian wants to propose. If that's how they wanna reorganize the office, that's completely okay with me. I don't need to see it. They've spent time, they've spent hours. As he mentioned, they've been working on it since the summer. It, it's been collaborative with the employees as well. I think he just needs to say, we've changed the job descriptions and, and here's what they are. Thank you, Stephen. As always, very much worth listening to. Um, so, Brian, um, would you like to, uh, is there a particular reason why you wanted the board to approve this? Yeah, uh, I, I think as the board, I think the, the, yeah, sorry. So as the board, uh, uh, the uh, when you look at job descriptions, it's common practice in a lot of school districts to approve them because uh, the, the, the biggest, one of the biggest uh, control mechanisms, I know uh, we talked about this in the, um, uh, the budget training, you know, what does a board do, right? What does a board control? Well, the board controls the, um, the process and procedures and the resources that the, the, the board is a financial, not just a governing body that sets uh, policy, but also uh, oversees how money is spent and, uh, and dictates that. Uh, so in many ways, when you do a job responsibility, it's common practice that school boards do approve the job responsibilities uh, because that's typically what boards, school boards do as a district, in districts. Thanks. So you're not just being uh, solicitous towards us on the board, mm -hmm. trying to make us feel like we're needed um when in fact this is something that you could just do all by yourself and not well i would i would say that uh i'm very intentional in how i'm doing this um uh, and very strategic in how i'm doing this and uh there i i think that uh i definitely need the board right so i would never say that i would never need i would not need the board i definitely need the board and i am your employee and i think it's very important that you are aware of the folks that work under under my leadership, so you have an idea of what people do and what they're supposed to do. Thank you, thank you very much. Chris, did I, did I see your box light up? Um, no, not intentionally. Okay. Um, thank you though. Uh, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, are, are there any are there any views that um, Lindy? Well, I kind of agree with Stephen about the job descriptions, but I do like the idea of the um, flow chart of the jobs that are in the central office, and that also gives us an idea of how many people, what they're doing, just by job titles, and then we could refer to job descriptions if we were wondering why do they have three of these payroll people or whatever. Um, so I think more the um, flow chart of jobs, responsibilities, and how that works in a system is uh, worth sharing with the board. Not necessarily that we approve it, but that information is important to me. Thanks, Lindy. Uh, other, other discussion? Um, uh, Stephanie Strong feelings along the lines of what Stephen and Lindy have been doing that this that this is actually sort of in some sense more than the board should be doing Chris did you Scott hello I, no I yes Chris oh, okay thank you. um I, I actually uh don't agree with Stephen and Lindy on this one um, because by having the job descriptions come before us 
um, it makes us aware of what is actually being proposed for each job. Uh, and if we are basically giving up uh, oversight um, of that process, job descriptions could be um, modified and changed um, so that it is extending the boards and, and the districts um, need to fund other positions because uh, responsibilities have been shifted um, and it, it becomes accomplished as opposed to uh, thought about and agreed to. So I think it's just, it, it keeps us informed in a way that we should be informed um, about what employees are doing what in the central office. Thanks. Scott? Um, by approving, uh, did, yeah. hi, please. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. So I just really quickly, I, I, I completely agree with Stephen's sentiment. I, I think this is way too detailed for us and uh, down on the management level. Um, however, it's important to Brian. So let's just do it and let's go quickly. It's informational. And um, if it helps him to have our support with a formal vote, let's just do that and, and move through it as quickly as possible is what I say. Once again, wisdom. Um, and so uh, unless there is any further discussion, shall to a vote, all in favor of approved job descriptions as moved by Floor and um, seconded by Jayala. Um, I'm not sure I remember anymore exactly. Um, please click yes. Opposed, click no. Uh, yes. Then yes from Chris. Thank you very much. And um, I see unanimous approval. And Ryan has, again, taken note of the sentiment of the board on this question and will factor it into his future uh, activities. Flora. Uh, just a, a could we ask somebody's not muted? My internet is a little unstable today, and there's somebody not muted, and it makes it really hard to listen. Just I don't know if I'm the only one that it can hear it, but if somebody there's somebody not, I see it. I, Chris, you're muted now. Great, thank you. Great, thanks very much, everybody. Um, okay, so uh, Brian, back to you. Thank you all. Uh, the, uh, the next piece is about the enrollment trends uh, that we were talking about. The, uh, there was a report and that starts on page 36. Uh, there is some updates to the enrollment trends. Uh, I know in the budget training, we talk about uh, the enrollment piece is a huge piece, not just in our district, but across the state of Vermont, uh, where we are seeing declining enrollment uh, across schools in the state and in districts around the state. And we do know that our census, according from 29, October 1st, 2019 uh, to October 1st, 2020, seems to have gone down by 87 students. So we did get, uh, I did ask the principals to reach out to families. Uh, we did have them uh, look, we also looked at the, uh, did some extra homework and did some assignment uh, that was assigned uh, last from, as a result of last board meeting. And they did get together. They did provide a report to me today as at three o'clock PM today. Um, and it was, uh, they believe that they have, may have found at the early grades, this is like the pre-enrollment grades where, where you have children who are uh, brand new, you know, brand new uh, to this world. <laughs> uh, and they believe they may have found an additional 21 students uh, that uh, that is, is some good news, right? Because we originally thought that it was uh, 87 students. but So now we're down to still a decrease for next year of at least 66 students. It's still a, um, a moving target, right? Because somebody could have a baby anytime, you know, anytime and, or move into our, into our town. But right now we're still seeing a decrease of 66 students, which means that we could be getting some significantly less funding uh, from uh, the state uh, for the next budget cycle. I don't know if, uh, uh, I know Lori, you know, Lori and I, we talked about this. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add on that part, but 
we do have the, uh, we all, every year we do the NASDAQ projections report and the NASDAQ, I put the trends on there. I'm not going to go into it. It's all in the packet unless you have questions about it. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this is based on the 2019 student enrollment projection report. I literally, as of today, received an updated 2020 projection report. Uh, so I will have to analyze that and get that out, out to you in a future board meeting so you have it. We can compare the 2019 to the 2020 report and still uh, look at these uh, 21 uh, additional students where the principals got. I got that again at 3 o'clock today. But it still seems that we're going to have a, a significant decline in enrollment for next year. Uh, and what does that mean for the year after next year as well? And I think the big part, and I want to emphasize this, is the two-year rolling average, right? That is going to be huge for our district. And what does that mean uh, for our money in the future? Thanks, Brian. Are there board member questions on enrollment? Enrollment trends? If uh, the floor, um, was that a gesture? No, no, no. Uh, I'm all, all set. Okay. Um, if not, uh, Brian, I, I think you may still have more to come. Uh, yes, more more to come. I, I I'll, I'll follow up with the board with additional enrollment when we get that. When we get that, we literally got the report today, and I got the information from the uh, principals. I'm be meeting with the principals again uh, very shortly uh, about those students and uh, some other things. So. I think ultimately, uh, um, you know, I'll have it, uh, an updated about the enrollment, and that's something we're just going to have to keep our eyes on, uh, and how that's going to impact our budget. Because uh, 66 kids, you know, with the equalized pupil per per student, is significant money. Yeah, um, Jonas. Um, so just real quick, from from having read through this, you know, a lot of this seems to be, you know more kids being homeschooled you know because of the pandemic a lot of this seems to be very few you know pre and pre pre-k uh kids you know we haven't lost a lot at u32 i understand that the um you know the the loss of tuition students is you know a, a revenue problem um it's also hard to predict the future but it doesn't it seem like if you know knock wood things return to normal if there's a vaccine, um, you know, sometime next summer or fall, you know, widely distributed, that numbers will normalize, and that and, and and that this is a, you know, an acute rather than a chronic event. Uh, I would, I I definitely want to say hopefully yes. The answer to, I would hope to say the answer to that question is yes. However, looking at that Nesdek report. Uh, it does show a decline over the next several years, and it does show uh, a decline from the previous several years. And so uh, it, it seems to be trending downward, uh, no matter which way you uh, roll it. The question is, how dramatic is it, right? So this year seems to be more dramatic than uh, previous years, uh, and that may be because of the homeschooling and the COVID and the situation that we have. Uh, but if, if that is, you know, the two-year average is still going to be impactful uh, moving forward. And I know that the state currently has said that they're going to hold us harmless this year. Uh, however, um, it still means that we're going to have a, the, the previous year uh, was lower than the last year. So we're still getting a lower average, no matter, even if we, a lower average than the, the previous year before that. So it still seems to me that we're going to have to consider or how we uh, how we uh, utilize our resources as they become a little more scarce. I I, I hear that uh, you know there there are you know larger systemic you know issues in Vermont that are, that lead to that long term trend, right? We saw that last year as well. Yeah. Um, um, you know, but I'm optimistic that you know our location, our rural location, you know, the fact that a lot of people from away have been introduced to Vermont, you know, over the last you know, eight, nine, 10 months now um, that, you know, we are an attractive place to live. Um, we're an attractive school district. We provide good education. We have a good track record. Um, that 
know, that downward trend may continue, but I think that we will see rebounds next year. At least that's my not so informed opinion. <laughs> Sounds good anyway. Fleur. I, I guess uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying, Jonas, and I, I, like, I, I would like to be optimistic too, and hopefully we will be able to stay, you know, they will be able to keep us harmless. I, I do worry that this might make us get closer to the excess spending uh, by, you know, we, we have less students, so we'll be dividing into less students. So our tax rate, uh, we might be too close to that excess spending uh, the way that we are right now. So maybe this year we're able to just get over it, but in next year we, we are gonna start to, you know, have, have to have serious conversations about how we are spending our, our, our money and if all our kids are having the best opportunities that they can, the way that we are managing right now as a district. Thanks, um, Diane and then Steven. So thanks uh, for Brian for getting that information. I'm wondering though, if we can have more of a broader trend look. So can we look at previous five years um, you know, also in terms of um, real estate and capacity. So again, it's always a hit or miss and we need to be careful about it, but we also need to get a better sense of what does this trend look like? Because um, right now we know we're in a blip, but we're trying to survive this blip. But what, what can we inform in terms of previous five years? Thanks. Um, Stephen, look. And I don't want to belabor it tonight, but to me, this suggests the board um, needs to do some, as was suggested, we need more information, but I think this should become a board responsibility to understand this trend. And just as it's our responsibility to offer um, budget development guidelines the board should review this and and offer some guidelines to the administration on how we should proceed. Um, I appreciate Jonas's comments, but hope is not a method, and our responsibility is plan to plan based on the information that we have. Um, I don't think there's any need for anything dramatic or anything initial and if things smooth out then that works well but i think we have to plan based on what the current trend is thanks for steven uh brian yeah and, and i just want to uh further comment on uh, page 38 of the packet i did talk about uh the homeschooler list for enrollment trends and uh we had uh on may 29th 2020 just to give everyone an idea of last year we had 47 students in homeschool uh, and uh, this year, early, earlier this month, we had 80 students on the home list, uh, and uh, eight of them returned to school uh, because I, they were happy to come back to school. But uh, of the remaining 72, 37 are new uh, to it. So you know, 30, if 37 students do come back, we're still thir down 30 if the numbers that the principals provided. You know, so, I mean, it's nice to say, hey, we started with 87, and but we're still getting down 30 kids is still, if that's the case, still going to impact a lot, of, a lot of money coming in over a longer period of time. Yeah, um, thanks. Any further discussion on this or um, I, on the agenda? This is the last, um, the last bit of yours, Brian, directly before we move on to the any, any final, for the, of course, final words for this part of the agenda for the um, for the superintendent, Caroline. Um, on page thirty eight, under additional information, this is sort of just um, sharing my thoughts. Um, but under two A, the loss of students from Roxbury, Orange, and Washington. It came up in the budget um, last time that, if I'm remembering it correctly, that there was a, um, like we budgeted for more students than we actually got from Orange. So I just wanna say when I see that, 
uh, um, Roxbury makes sense because they merged with Montpelier. And I don't know that Orange and Washington have done anything different. I think they're still choice towns. And so just um, to me, it's just a point of noticing when fewer tuition students choose our high school. Um, it's not a huge determining factor, but it's for me as a, it's just always noteworthy. And so I just wanted to um, put that out there. It's something that in the report, it kind of has a little thought for me. I don't know if their numbers went down or if they're choosing other high schools over ours, but it's just a, a piece. Uh, can, can I? Uh, I, I see. Uh, Please, Brian. Go ahead. Yeah, and I might, I might have, I might have, Principal uh, Stephen uh, also comment, but I believe part of this came down to a consolidation out, out of Act. I don't want to say the word Act Forty Six because that, that gets people angry here, uh, and uh, and it makes me angry too. By the way, just so you, so, uh, but the uh, but the thing is, I believe that because the consolid other districts consolidated. Children in those communities now have an opportunity to go to a different high school. I, I guess Principal Stephen probably can brief you more about it, right? Yeah, I, I think Lori, Lori, and I both have have looked at these numbers over the years. Um, we just um, you, there's not as many kids that come from those towns at times, but we've also got a fair number of them here in the school right now. So um, the overall numbers um, are going down for us as well. And then I would just offer, and, and Brian uh, alluded to it, is that now that uh, the Echo Valley uh, District exists, um, the Williamstown High School um, is a, it can be a, a, a new option for those kids um, and a preferred option in some cases uh, for them. It's also interesting note, if you go to Echo Valley, one of their schools, you have Randolph as your tech center, as opposed to Barry, uh, you know, the central Vermont. So there's some different programs there as well. So a lot of little factors for also a very small number of kids who can make choices uh, depending on what they need. So it's it's not necessarily a reflection on what we offer. It's just that they have a lot of choices. Yeah. And I also think that in the last few years, you've graduated a lot more kids from those towns than we've been taking in at the earlier grades. Yeah, exactly. And we'll see that happen in the next couple of years as well. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, are we good then? Should we move on to the leadership team report? Sure. All set? Yeah, let's, let's, let's okay. do it. Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, Scott, I lost you. No, 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 I, I wasn't saying anything. I, I think I was waiting. It's an Alphonse Gaston moment here. Um, um, so uh, board member questions on the leadership team report? Uh, or is there, would, would you like to um, add anything or say anything to preface it, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I think the idea is that, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to have the principals and uh, district folks uh, who have been involved in making this report to, you know, come on in and talk about uh, what what talk about their section in this report like we did last time? I thought I worked pretty well. Um, I, I know that we did parent teacher conferences on uh, November 11th. Uh, it was a different time. It was it was definitely a very different than in the past. It was during Zoom. Uh, it was held during Zoom. Uh, the fall the fall conferences are an opportunity to check in with families about their hopes for the year and to share evidence of students' current strengths and areas for growth. Um, and our district typically enjoys a very high participation rate in parent-teacher conferences. Uh, we've also done some fall assessments. I don't know if uh, Jen Miller wants to talk about uh, fall assessments. Sure. She, great. I, sure. Um, as I wrote in the report for you all, we spent a lot of time this summer, the remote curriculum instruction and assessment task force uh, articulating the plans for the fall, really wanting to strike that balance between understanding how our kids were doing, wanting to see them and, and assess them, but also knowing that they had not been in school since March regularly, and we needed to take the time to uh, sort of balance their social emotional learning needs as well. So we uh, factored some information into the plan so that teachers had a lot more time to, um, to administer those assessments as they felt like their students were ready. 
And, um, and then we were able to spend time, especially around the iReady math diagnostic, uh, analyzing those data and acting on them after the October in service day. So we just got the curriculum council together to talk through uh, what, how it was in the fall and how that's gonna inform the winter. And again, we're looking at um, it sort of pushing back those winter, winter windows a little bit and again, trying to stretch them out so that teachers have more um, leeway, I think, in terms of when their students are ready. Some folks administered right away in September and some waited till later in October. And so we really want teachers to use their judgment, um, understanding that this is a particularly unusual year and that in general, our windows will be tighter and closer, but in this year, this seems to be the right way to go. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to look at the assessment plan that uh, the district has been working under, uh, under Jen's leadership and her team. Uh, and uh, very impressive with the amount of work that uh, she's put together. And uh, I think that planning document is going to help us uh, as we move forward in the future with the assessment uh, strategy. Uh, remote planning. I think uh, I know the, I know there's we should we be asking our remote principal and uh, I think I know there's some sections about uh, special education in here. G Gillian, do you want to talk about the uh, I wasn't sure. remote school? Uh, the, I thought the, well, the remote planning was. The, no, no, no. I was going to have you talk about the remote planning school. More about the planning for when bricks and mortar schools go remote. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll talk about remote school when I talk about Dodi. You do Dodi? Okay. All right. So the remote planning piece is really the uh, leadership team has been working on uh, putting structures in place, uh, developing what, what what's going to happen if we go into remote. We've uh, had many, many uh, lively discussions. Kind of reminds me of our summertime together uh, back in July and August. Uh, it, was, uh, it was good to get everyone back together because sometimes it's very hard to get the group together uh, because we're, we have school going on. Uh, so right now uh, we've been, we, we're going to continue to uh, have those conversations about what remote planning could look like, what do our teachers need. Uh, these half days that we've had have been very helpful uh, to help work with our teachers on developing that plan in case we go to remote. Uh, there is a, a part about special ed. I don't know if Kelly, you want to uh, talk about the special ed piece? Sure. Um, so just currently what's happening is um, by uh, Friday, actually, um, all of our case managers are working um, at the school level to develop contingency schedules. Um, since we came back in the fall, all IEPs needed to be taken a look at and developed um, to include what's called the state is calling contingency plans um, on, on the service page of an IEP. So, and again, that's just um, being proactive and setting us up in the event that we do go into a remote learning mode for a long period of time. And so um, our case managers did that in the first few weeks of school. And now they're taking those plans and developing um, schedules um, for in the event we have to shift to remote. And they're also working with the building principals to develop schedules for the paraeducators um, so that should we shift into remote, we have plans in place um, you know, right away and that we don't have to be in a crisis mode to get all of those plans um, up and ready. And so those plans are all due uh, by the end of this week. So there's lots of things happening related to that. Yeah, they, they've been uh, doing, doing a very good job of keep, keeping Kelly very busy. I can tell you that much. Uh, it's a huge undertaking with uh, special education and going, to, going remote. Uh, again, we're hoping that doesn't happen, but we are working to make sure we are ready when it does. So thank you, Kelly, for all your help and leadership in that area. Uh, Can I add one more quick thing? Sure, absolutely. Sorry, that it's in there. I um I recently actually am experiencing Canvas as a teacher, um, and I'm learning. I'm setting up a classroom uh, in the spring. You know, we had created quickly some Google Docs with lots of um, professional development opportunities for paras for times that they um, were not scheduled to work. We were giving them some meaningful learning opportunities. And so in continuing to do that uh, and wanting to experience Canvas myself, 
I jumped into and committed to creating a Canvas classroom so that paras also could be practicing and experiencing it more. And so over the last couple of weeks, I've been spending time with one of our Canvas coaches and um, <laughs> figuring this out. And I have a much deeper appreciation for what our teachers are navigating and figuring out on the fly. Um, it is not a very intuitive program, but when it's all set up, it will be great for all of those that are using it. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. So uh, let's move on to Berlin, Berlin Elementary School. Principal Boynton. Hi, good evening, everybody. So I was thinking about some comments for tonight and um, uh, was thinking about um, how things are going, obviously, at Berlin. Um, obviously, just with the state of everything, uh, I'll be honest and say stress and anxiety is high among staff. But um, as we always tell ourselves, we are Berlin strong. And uh, we talk about our collective commitments that we have established. And um, regardless of the times, regardless of the year, um, those, those ring true to get us through what we need to, to do um, to get us through times. Um, so I appreciate the staff's steadfastness um, their, their perseverance, their hard work. Um, Canvas is coming along very nicely. Um, folks are more and more comfortable every day. They all have standing meetings every week with our in-school coach to um, become more fluent with, with using Canvas. So that's going well. Um, and as always, just thanking and um, congratulating our, our students for coming through the door every day and um, working tremendously hard with all the things that they have to um, put up with when it comes to all the safety precautions. <clears throat> uh, we were fortunate to have a 94% parent conference attendance rate, which is really, really good. Um, I also mentioned in my report that um, one of the things we do every Thanksgiving <clears throat> is one of our local, local businesses donates Thanksgiving meals to families. Uh, that business is not able to donate this year at all. So um, we decided as a, as, as a staff to uh, prepare six Thanksgiving meals for, for families. So um, even though things are stressful and anxiety is high and everyone is working really, really hard, um, it doesn't get in the way of the giving that uh, the staff at our school um, do for, for kids and families. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for your leadership. And uh, I definitely agree. It's, it's definitely a uh, very stressful and anxious time. Uh, and I do know that some people have started the countdown to Thanksgiving break. So uh, we're getting there, right? So, uh, but thank you. Uh, moving forward on to Principal Fair and Callis Elementary School. Hello, everyone. Um, Callis, uh, you probably recall, has a big HVAC project that is um, beginning. Um, it's underway already. Um, so we are anticipating going fully remote um, the week of December 7th. And, excuse me, that's going to last for about two, two and a half weeks. I anticipate it's going to take us right through the December break. Um, the kids and staff have just been incredibly resilient because we're feeling a fair bit of urgency around let's hurry up and get ready to be remote. We can't wait until everyone goes remote. Like we have to figure this out now. Um, and that urgency can sometimes push us to, um, to not want to go deep in the work. I've just been so incredibly impressed with my staff. I'm not sure that when we, we went with Canvas as a, as a learning management system that we thought, what would this look like for our early or young learners and the parents that will, it will be their position to support them. Um, but it's a lot. Uh, the Kelly, I had a kindergarten teacher that was just like you that talked to, invited me into the classroom today, Miss Lavangie. 
She um, was so proud of herself and her kids. Um, right now, what they're doing is they're focusing on not just how to upload um, uh, and give opportunities for new instruction in Canvas, but to make sure that even our youngest learners, kindergarten, five and six year olds, have the capacity to understand how to navigate Canvas and to click on a Zoom link and to know what comes next. Today, what they were what they were practicing was how they could show their parents when they went home tonight um, how to give um, how to upload their own assignments and get feedback from their teacher. What I was. And the Miss Lavangie alone, the smile on her face was gorgeous to see. And some of those five-year-olds, um, I saw some sticky fingers, that was icky, but they were having the best time and they were so proud of the work and their, their facility um, to navigate. And, and boy, was that an inspiration to some of our uh, teachers who needed that little boost, like Erin shared um, at Callis. The, the worry is high, the concern is high, and my staff rocks and is resilient and they're figuring out a way to really focus first on kids. Um, a quick update um, beyond getting ready for going remote on our building is getting really cold and really loud. Um, they're doing the work that they can do um, before all of the equipment arrives from overseas. Um, but there are times this morning, the kids were like, is something gonna come through the ceiling over our fifth and sixth grade? Cause they were putting in all of the framework, the sheet metal, the housing that's gonna go around some of the units. Um, there were big fans to make sure that the, the air was exiting the building and not coming back into the building from the mezzanine and the attic spaces. And um, I think they felt like the, the workmen were gonna fall through the ceiling. That's not happening. They're not even over the ceiling, but sound travels. Um, it's a little distracting, but the workmen have been great. Um, the work is going well. And I think as long as fingers crossed all of us, the equipment arrives on time, we'll, we'll do well. That's, that's what's happening at Callis. And uh, kudos to Principal Fair and her staff uh, for managing not just school, regular school during a pandemic, because nothing is regular at that point, but also doing an HVAC project in the middle of a pandemic. So, uh, uh, but uh, thank you for all your all that you're doing over at Callis. And uh, moving on, uh, next we have Principal Gillian and Doty, which I know has had an interesting uh, time since our last board meeting. <laughs> oh yes, so we we are back and thrilled to be back in person with the kids, lots of anxiety, lots of anxiety from the staff, lots of anxiety from families. Um, we did have some families who elected to keep their students home all week last week, just to sort of see how things were going there. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, staff is working really hard and it is really, really, it's just stressful these days and nervous making all the way around. We don't have any exciting construction projects happening right now, which is actually kind of nice. One thing that we are noticing is we did notice that a, um, a large number of our students, probably most of our students did come back in the fall with some regression in their basic skill areas, just from having been out, out of school for six months. And that wasn't a surprise. What is really nice is that we're seeing that by now, most of those students have regained the skills that they lost during the time of closure. Uh, so that's nice. It's, it's just sort of looking forward and thinking about, you know, really we have to conceptualize grades and grade level, you know, where kids are at. It's gonna take us a long time to come back from this one. Uh, the dog is starting to maybe snore a little bit. Um, in terms of, I, I do have to give a mea culpa. I did forget to write the remote school blurb. So uh, in the packet, but my Puritan guilt has kicked in sufficiently to make sure that that comes in next month's packet. The remote school is going well. We did have some students leave at the end of the first quarter 
because they just decided to go for the first quarter to see what was going to be happening in in-person school. Um, we've had a couple more students move into the in-person, I mean, into the remote school. Um, some families moved into the district and went straight into the remote school. We are working to figure out some of the online platforms and learning tools that are using that we're using for that. I think that they are working on planning yet another all school Zoom meeting. Uh, very excited that we have gotten music started for the remote school. And PE is going to be starting after Thanksgiving. And the remote teachers met with the school counselors uh, actually today to work on figuring out how we can get some social and emotional uh, support in for our remote students. And oh, we've also worked, um, worked out figuring out intervention services for the remote students. And so it's a, it's a giant puzzle with constantly moving parts. So that's keeping me busy. So I, you know, go out and see what's happening in Doty, and then I sit in my office and see what's happening with remote school, and it's a really nice blend. Thank you very much, uh, Pr Principal Gillian, uh, and uh, appreciate the update on the remote school. I know that's been a lot of work, as well as uh, the uh, recent events at Doty. But uh, thank you for your leadership in, uh, in steering, the, steering the ship through um, this turbulent time. East Montpelier, Principal Lyford. Yeah, there's a few things I would add to what's in the written report. Um, our teachers, I would uh, um, offer the same sentiments as my colleagues. They're, they're a bit overwhelmed. Anxiety is high. I think anxiety is high on the part of parents as well. I had a meeting today with a prospective parent and they wanted to know the right time to have their child start school. And I said, you know, we don't know. We're kind of holding our breath over this next month and hoping that we'll stay in the great place that we've been in. Um, but it's there's just a lot of unknown right now and that that's a little uneasy for people. Um, we had a substantial donation from a uh, community group to our, it's, we have a fund called the EMES Cares Fund. And um, so that was a very pleasant surprise. They wanted to just um, have East Montpelier use the money in whatever way we felt the community and the school needed it. We also had, um, similar to how Aaron shared, we have a local church who typically donates Thanksgiving meals. Um, and they because they weren't able to donate the actual food this year, we have eight families who will be getting gift cards for Thanksgiving meals Friday at the end of the day to do some shopping for their Thanksgiving. Um, we've been participating in a three-part PD module with our staff around formative assessment. So just tagging on to what Jen was saying about um, the fall assessment data, we looked at that and our teachers set goals. Um, I think probably in all of our schools, we saw regression um, or some pretty stagnant scores from last winter, which is the last time we really have um, some good scores from and so our teachers today shared their goals um, in reading, writing, and math with one another. And um, next time we gather together, right after Thanksgiving, we're going to bring dilemmas and participate in a consultancy protocol on, you know, okay, here's this kiddo. They haven't moved. Here's some work samples and try to support each other and working through how can we get um, these kids back to where they need to be because they're there are some who stayed right, you know, stayed the course and are where they should be. And there's others who kind of lost some ground. And then we have some students who lost significant ground. Um, and we're um, in a place where we're trying to work together to get them back to where they need to be. Um, and then I would say on the Canvas front, this afternoon, our teachers spent the afternoon with our Canvas specialist um, learning how to take multiple data points and create assignments, um, when to use a rubric for assignments, when not to use a rubric, um, and just trying to get a little bit more efficient with the assignment piece of it. Now that they're getting the hang of creating assignments, we're trying to, to get a little bit better and learn some tricks around that. Um, I think that's it for us. Uh, thank you, Principal Lyford. Uh, and I, I appreciate you talking more about the Canvas piece because I know that is 
a uh, quite an undertaking for our teachers, staff, and for our principals. Right, this is a just a new, a, a major new thing to be learning about uh, while you're also teaching and running a school. So, thank you for uh, talking more about that. Uh, moving forward, Principal Casey. Thank you. Um, a lot's been said already, and so I'm going to echo some of it. Um, I will just say that conferences were a great opportunity for us to connect with families. Uh, we do miss welcoming families into the school, seeing them in person and, and having some informal ways to touch base. Uh, so conferences were great to be able to make, make more consistent contact there and to touch base about how everyone's doing. Um, we've been making the most out of our Wednesday opportunities uh, for professional development. Our teachers have been learning a lot more about Canvas, trying things with students in the classroom. Uh, there's still a long way to go, but just to acknowledge, as everyone sort of has, we are asking teachers to plan and prep for what they're doing in person, but also planning and prep for remote, which we hope not to use. Um, so we're asking a lot of teachers um, and they're carrying a lot with them. Uh, students are doing well on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we continue to remind them to wear their masks, which they do really well with, with wearing masks. Uh, staying apart from each other is hard to remember, but we remind them and they understand that they have to do that. Hand washing continues to be going really well. Um, so just to circle back to our staff, um, just to underscore for you that they're working super hard. They're carrying their own worries each day to school, uh, their worries for their own health, for their families, for their students and families, their colleagues. Um, but they continue to put on a smile under their mask that you can see through their eyes and give their best to students each day. So um, our staff is working really hard to make this school year as, um, as normal and as successful as it can be for our students. I think you said that very eloquently, uh, Casey, and uh, appreciate your help in the work of uh, your staff during this uh, very challenging time. So thank you for all your all that you do uh, and your teachers as well. And uh, last but certainly not least, Principal Stephen. All right, so um, you've heard the, the trials and tribulations. They're no different here at, uh, at U32 of what we're all going through. Um, but I have two teachers that are here on this call right now who um, wanted to, and I want to give them the chance to thank you guys for what you've given them. So Daisy, you're out there somewhere, and Hollis, I know you are too. So um, I'm calling on two of my middle school teachers to uh, to finish my report. All right. Hi. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say that um, definitely in a year that's been very new for everyone, even uh, experienced teachers that's felt, our years felt very relentless. Um, as we all know, having the half day Wednesdays has brought us a significant amount of reprieve in that um, it gives our core teams time to meet and our content teams time to meet. So with our new teachers in the building, um, this has provided the senior teachers with some time to really guide them and just provide some stress relief. Um, so we have time to get together and talk about content and teaching and how to go remote and just how to handle all the newness um, and stress of the year. So we appreciate the time that we're getting. Um, and I guess I won't take up more of your time, but I will add in that I'm working very hard to add three kindergartners to um, our district. So, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. We, we're all doing our part, it seems, um, here in, in the district. Uh, um, and uh, I would just also um, say that one of the things that I heard another principal, uh, not in our district, say that this year felt like all of her teachers were first year teachers. Um, and, uh, and quite honestly, it just resonated so much as to how many new things that we're all learning and doing. Um, that it has felt that way a lot, but I really feel right now that all of those, all of that experience that um, that we have in our schools is really starting to show now as we're getting into the, you know, the depths of winter is that we really see what a fantastic staff that we have in our district um, and, and how well they're able to handle these situations that we keep throwing at them. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the reason that we're all still able to meet at all. And so, uh, so I really just want to praise them for the work that they're doing and, and what they're all uh, all able to do for all of us. And so, um, we're we're going to fight the good fight and keep it going here at U32. And um, you can read all about it in the news, I'm sure. 
Thank you, Stephen. I'm sure we will be reading about it. So thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, that is our leadership team report. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions for the principals, uh, but I, if they, they I thought just so you know, it is a long day for them. So after the after the questions are, uh, you ask questions. I like to uh, if they want, they're dismissed. If they wish to leave, uh, if they want to stay, but be, but be my guest. <laughs> Uh, but uh, also uh, Elizabeth, I would probably ask Elizabeth to uh, get some sleep. She's had a long day with surveillance testing and uh, the COVID case, and I'm sure we'll need her bright and bushy eye, bright eyed and bushy eye, bushy tail tomorrow. So uh, uh, in the morning, um, just a quick one, if I may. Um, did I did I hear um, you, Stephen, mention that Hollis might have something to say too? Yeah, I'm not sure if he was just here supporting uh, Daisy, but he's he's hanging around out there as well. I don't know if uh, he's just lurking, but um, they're they're a team down there in the middle school. There are department heads down there in the middle school. So, I don't know, Hollis, if you have anything to add, it's your chance. Apparently not. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. And well, we're we're so immensely grateful to to all of you and your your colleagues, both those who are who are here and those who are not. Um, thank you, and good luck. Um, and and good night. Uh, am I missing uh, Brian? Are you yeah, pointing? you got some folks. Jonas they has have some questions. Jonas, I think Fl Flora was first. No, I, I was just wondering if Jody had something to share with us because she I've seen her in you know so I was that was that was my only question. I thought you were watching my cat. <laughs> I I was and and Mia came to see your cat, but I <laughs> I saw that. I um I just appreciate all the hard work that everyone's been doing across the district, teachers, students, leadership team, and thank you for the Wednesdays because that really has helped our staff across the district and um, we're working on a for December the first December Wednesday an ed camp model of PD for teachers using canvas some different tools that we have a couple of new tools that go with it and um, just making sure that they're feeling more comfortable with it then so we're just excited to keep that work going and and have the time to do it thank you thanks Jonas um, so just a, a couple of quick questions. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, we were shown some really good attendance rates, um, which was really awesome to see. But I wonder now during the current spike, you know, what, you know, what the attendance trend looks like. Um, and you know, sort of in a, in a similar vein are, you know, are we seeing, you know, uh, you know, I, I know that, you know, if families want to uh, to take advantage of the remote program, right? We've asked them to talk to their principals. So I wondered, you know, if the, you know, if the principals are seeing increased numbers of family. Now, I know that you said, you know, we lost some students in the remote school, we gained some students in the remote school, but are more parents asking those questions, right? And thinking particularly about the period, you know, between, you know, between the holidays and a couple of weeks into the new year when gatherings are expected to spike cases anymore you know what are the atmospherics around that and um you know I'm, ju I'm just curious about what what that looks like in the different schools well well i can start off jonas by saying that uh i pr uh, i do speak with uh principal stephen fairly consistently about this particular uh this particular matter about the attendance uh the attendance has been fairly high uh in, in the district it's been lower than it was uh, to, be, to be completely honest, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. I'm sure Principal Stephen can talk about his particular school, but uh, I, I do know they've gone down a little bit, but I'm, I'm not sure by exactly how much at this point. Yeah, so I would just tell you that we were averaging um, about 20 students out in the seventh and eighth grade, and now we're seeing it up closer to 35 um, per day. Um, some of those, I, I, I would say that there's a fair number of people who are home out of that uh, potential exposure yeah. um, issue. So a parent may have been exposed, and so the whole family is quarantining. So we have that in a few cases. Um, 
And so we actually, our families are doing us a big favor uh, by really taking it seriously. If someone in the household has been exposed, um, we've seen several families that say, hey, we've got to be out for a few days till we get testing back and all of that. And yes, thank you. You know, those are, those are what we want to see. Um, but we do have some families that have expressed concern, particularly um, once we saw 100 cases in Vermont was when we started to see um, people get a little bit nervous. Um, we've had conversations with them, and uh, and for the most part, they're they're still here. But you know, there's a couple that are saying we're going to kind of hold off till after Thanksgiving. And any you know, any atmospherics from the from the elementary principals and, you know, and from from Stephen? Yep, Alicia. Yeah, I would just add, Jonas, to your question around the whole remote and families wanting to go and all of that. We had a lengthy conversation about that um, just this week. The elementary principals, Jen and Kelly, um, because we are starting to get parents asking, you know, what about part time? What if we just go remote through the holidays? Is that an option? Um, and so we're wrestling with that. We don't have any really great answers right now because we have, and we've had since the fall of, you know, 100% in-person, 100% remote switch at the quarter. Um, and now this, you know, with the rising cases, parents understandably are asking what can they do? So that is something that we are grappling with and, and need to continue talking about um, and don't have any really great uh, solutions right now. And I, I will say that uh, uh, talking with other superintendents, it comes down to system capacity. Uh, would we have the capacity to do something like that? And uh, with the way our teachers are feeling, I mean, we you heard from all the principals today that teachers are you know have a lot on their plates to expect them to start going remote and teaching at the same time in live person would be something I would not ask our teachers to do at this time. Uh, I, I think the system is very fragile. And so I've been communicating with parents that while we're continuing to have conversations and grapple with it, uh, we're really not at any, we really will not be able to uh, accommodate those types of requests right now from, from t uh, parents keeping their kids home. Uh, and, you're, of, it, and you're talking about short-term enrollment yes, in yes, remote yeah. school. <laughs> That's right. Okay. But you know, having heard from, uh, from you know, a, a bunch of you, you know, guys in the, in the, in the leadership team, it doesn't sound like you have concerns about people, you know, too many kids staying home because their families, you know, don't want them out there, you know, in public, in the community. And it does, you know, while, you know, Alicia, I, I, I totally hear you about wrestling with those questions. Um, it doesn't, it also doesn't sound like you guys are concerned about, you know, overcrowding in the remote school or having to, you know, deploy more resources there, you know, if there is a wave of enrollments. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we're not worried about it. <laughs> yes, it's a worry. Um, like when I said earlier, we're kind of holding our breath, right? We, we just don't know yet. Um, so the next quarter, which is what we've been telling families, comes in January. Um, will there be a wave of families who want to go remote in January? Possibly. Um, and how will we address that? We're not sure. And I think the other complicating thing, Jonas, is we have some families, we are leaving ourselves some room. There are some families who started the year um, with expressed anxiety because there's um, either a new baby or somebody with, um, with a compromised health uh, condition in the, in the house. And we are trying to be responsive to that. However, with the message that that if you are going to switch to remote, because the remote school and the bricks and mortar schools aren't going marching in lockstep, you need to make a substantial time commitment to it. But it is, it, it's 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 a it feels a bit precarious in terms, of, and we are holding our breaths in terms of attendance. Uh, I did put in the digest today just um lots of there had or Monday there had been lots of scuttlebutt kind of about if we can't have social gatherings why can we still have school and i honestly haven't had enough time being out and about and going to lbj's to be honest to find out 
how other people are talking about it and kind of have getting my ear to the ground for that one. But I, I do see, um, you know, at Doty, there's been kind of peaks and valleys in terms of the attendance, but we are tending to see more students absent. Is there a point, you know, is there a threshold where that becomes, you know, a real concern for, you know, student outcomes in the aggregate? I would, I would say, yeah, it does. I mean, that's one thing that we have to sort of look at and think about and balance and talk with Brian about is if you have a large percentage of students out who aren't accessing the direct instruction, you can, you can keep up with Canvas on it to an extent. But it's sort of the, you know, when we were talking about attendance and, and those things, we were using the old analogy of when the kid went to, when, it was, when the families took trips to Disneyland. And that doesn't really work when you're sort of in a situation where all of a sudden a larger percentage of your families are taking the, the trips to Disneyland. And sort of thinking about how do we ensure that we are providing um, as robust an education as we can to all students. So it's, these are challenging times for sure. And I would also add though, I think the, when you talk about robust education, I think that um, this, the, 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 narr the story when I talk to parents is, you know, if we can keep, keep your kids in school, in-person learning, learning in person, uh, that's, that's the best way to do it. That's the best, uh, that's the best way to get an education uh, is coming to school and sending your child to school. Uh, and that's why I think there's such a move around the state and, you know, here in our district and, and other places around the country that have reopened fully to try to stay open fully. Uh, and, and, and I think that, you know, we're, 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 we're talking about our teachers uh, have been you know, learning a lot about Canvas, right? They're learning a lot, but a lot of them have been doing in-person instruction for a lot longer than they've been doing Canvas. And so I think uh, just just by that alone, you know, your your child. I think telling parents if we can keep the schools open, uh, your child's going to get a, probably a better education in person than they would remotely, uh, on average. Great. Um, uh, are we are we good on this? Um, Shall we move on then? To, uh, to the finance committee and bid farewell. Take a bye. If you guys, if you want to go home and go to sleep, feel free. If not, yeah, feel free to stay. But Elizabeth, you yeah. too. <laughs> Don't feel like you need to stick right. around. <laughs> All right. He's not talking. He's talking to the people who work for him. So, many, many thanks to all, and a good night. Floor. Um, I do believe we've arrived at the finance committee portion. Yeah, sure, I'll do a, a, a quick report and then we can move into the actions. Uh, we reviewed the budget presentation and I just want to talk briefly with the, with the board uh, about the, our intention for the budget presentation for December 2nd, because uh, we haven't had a time to all discuss it. So we're thinking on a, on a 15 minute presentation and we'll divide the presentation within our finance committee. And then we will have a public forum so that most of the meeting, the rest of the 45 minutes will be spent <coughs> with the public. And we are thinking of breaking up into small Zoom meetings. So it, it, into rooms uh, so that we would have a, 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 a one member of the board uh, be in each of those Zoom. We will try to do just board members depending on how many people we get. And we have some uh, specific uh, questions for, for the public for, the, for, for that. Uh, if you guys could send me input uh, a little bit later or, or tonight if you want. I don't wanna spend a lot of time trying to wordsmith those unless you see something that is really bothering you. We were thinking of three questions for the public as we go into those rooms and then we come back and debrief each room with one person debriefing from each so that we get a better involved we get better involvement from the community so the budget questions will be what clarifying questions do you have what are your reactions to this information 
and are we properly balancing the budget impacts on students, school, and taxpayers? So those were the three questions that we brainstormed with Carrie's help. And um, we will, uh, unless I, I, I don't know if you, should we, I'm looking at other uh, finance committee members, if we should spend some time wordsmithing those or do you uh, are okay with the finance committee taking charge of that part? Thumbs up or, okay, all right. So then uh, uh, moving on to that, the presentation re really looks much like any other budget presentation we've done. I'm not gonna share the slides right now, but uh, we condensed it. So it's a lot simpler and we can go faster. I didn't condense it, Brian and Lori <laughs> condensed it. And we gave the finance committee, gave them a lot of input uh, at our last meeting uh, this Tuesday. So the next thing that we would like to, I, I, we sent an email to all of you. So you had a little time to review the parameters. I, I don't think we need to go through the budget. The budget didn't change from the last time. And in looking at the clock uh, being 1945 already, we need to condense because <laughs> I really want to get into the quality committee stuff. So we have, a, a, we are suggested the, Finance Committee is recommending we, that this five uh, parameters, and I don't know if you had time to review them. I'm happy to read them out loud for the members of the public, uh, and then we can discuss. So the first one was continue to offer and further, and further develop the multi-tier system of supports to all students across all our schools. Uh, the second one, under the threshold for penalty, we just talked about that in our budget meeting bring the net impact of expenses budget in under 3%, include all three new initiatives that include strategic planning and, uh, and curriculum management bid, facilities director and health instruction for all the schools, the two schools that are missing health, develop a contingency plan of expense reduction options in case the tax rate is not favorable. So uh, that is that would be guidance that we would give to our administrators so that they can start to develop, you know, draft number two, if for a, a future meeting. So I wanted to spend a little time uh, getting input from you guys, and if I miss anything within those parameters, please, finance committee members, speak up. Kari. Hi. I, I would add a couple things to the, um, param the recommended parameters. One is that um, part of part of um, keeping the uh, net impact of the expenses below three percent and adding um, these three new initiatives to the extent possible in included in that was using fund balance where it was appropriate to do that. And by appropriate, we mean not having an outsized impact on future year's budgets and that sort of thing. So keep that in mind that, that that's something that we were comfortable with um, that, that um, is, part of, is part of the recommendation. And the, and the fifth one being developing a list of options. And that's just looking down the road and seeing if, for example, we learn that we're not gonna be held harmless for the reduction in students um, equalized people that we are going to we're going to need to re react to that and so we want to be prepared if we get information in December or January that forces us to make some hard decisions we at least want to know what the options are thank you Kerry Diane uh, so just a question procedurally so we put the parameters on it. It goes back to leadership team and the work, and then they create a new, a second budget proposal that includes those three initiatives. What, so then we come back and do we do a comparison to see what we've potentially impacted by that new, or are we saying if we agree to these parameters, that's what we agree to? I think that's that's an interesting question, but we are agreeing to these parameters to give them enough guidance so that they can develop that, uh, so they can develop that budget, whether they can actually get it under three percent. Uh, you know, we we don't we don't know. There, 
I, I, my hope is that they will show us, especially how it would affect student, uh, student outcomes. But ultimately, yeah, that is the guidance. They will develop budget that fits within this guidance to present to us because otherwise we, we're not being very clear uh, with, the, with, with them. So they, they need some clear guidance, but I, I feel confident that we're giving them with, especially with number one, we're giving them a, enough guidance to show what is important to us. And then we have very specific, uh, you know, in, especially don't get too worried about the three new initiatives. We're hoping that those are one-time expenses that maybe like Carrie was saying, we can, maybe we can use either maybe. grant money or some excess spending money. <laughs> Harry, you had something to If add. I can, I think Diane's question is a really important one process wise. And I don't know how you all did it last year, but to me, some of the possibilities would include Brian and Lori might come back with a budget that meets those parameters and we're just not comfortable with it. Maybe, maybe the reductions in other areas are just too much and we want to amend the parameters. Also, we might get new information. We may want to, we may want to um, add to or expand um, or edit our our previous um, parameters. I think I think it's somewhat dynamic, but I think it's helpful for us to give a sense of what our priorities are, and then let them do the detailed work of the budgeting, and then for the next draft and the next draft. It's a it's a it's a back and forth iterative process as I see it. So. Do you guys feel comfortable with those parameters? I don't know, Lori. Do you have something to add to to that? Um, I really appreciate the clarity and the direction, and I know Brian and I are already working on that. And tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, we'll be meeting with all the principals to continue with that. And I'm feeling very comfortable with those parameters right now. Thank you. I see Caroline. I missed you. Sorry. No, you're okay. Okay. So should, all good, move uh, move on. Do, do we need a motion? I feel like it's just a recommendation, so we don't need a motion, but uh, unless I'm wrong. Okay. You're good, Flora. So, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so moving on, I'm just gonna close that. So we're okay with questions, we're okay with the presentation. So moving on, uh, the only other, uh, there were several things, but I'm going to move this one into more important and let Brian talk about it. The substitute rate uh, of, of pay, just do a quick um, overview of, of what we did at the finance committee. Brian, would you like to speak to it or do you want me to present it? It's up to you. It's up to you. I mean, you, if you want to talk about it and then I can come back in. Uh, it's okay. Why don't you just, so we shorten the time to just do a quick uh, uh, explanation or, or, or floor I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt maybe what yeah. we could do is um entertain a motion and get a motion on the table and then take sure. it from there sure that um may, maybe even you would like to move it yeah so i'll uh, i'll make uh, a motion to and, and we did it in two parts or i'm getting to to that part of the i'll make a motion to adjust the the substitute uh, page uh, pay to 105, Brian. I'm trying to get quickly One, down to my motion. 115. 115, uh, and to not uh, require license for- uh, there, there Not no to have separate. a differentiation between licensed and non-licensed. It's a flat fee. Yeah. Lisa, were you able to get that? Yes, thank you. And I think the recommended link recommended language is on that page. Yeah, page I, was just, four. I was I was just trying to get down. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> well, I have two three packages open, but uh, <laughs> it's recommended that Washington uh, Central Unified Union School District no longer differentiate between license and not license for substitute pay, and the rate of pay continue to be a paid at a daily and a half day rate. <laughs> Uh, daily rate three uh, hundred and fifteen, and a half day rate sixty three dollars. Wonderful, thank you. I is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Jonas. 
and I just recalling and is recusing herself from the recall. Um, so discussion. I'll let you. Brian. Yeah, uh, in my uh, free time, uh, I read about. I, I read a book. One of my magazines I read is a district administration uh, magazine, and there was a great article. I'm not going to read the whole article to you, but it's called "A Suboptimal Situation," and basically the entire country, districts large and small, uh, are dealing with a substitute shortage right now uh, in in uh, across the country, and. This is a, it was a really good springboard to talk about a lot of different things, but uh, because this, we haven't updated the, uh, the sub pay since 2015, and uh, we did an analysis, and we are in one of the lowest paying school districts in the region for substitutes. We are the, the, one of the only school districts in the region that are open five days a week, and uh, we're having a sub shortage, but everyone's having a sub shortage. And we did start getting requests from uh, folks saying, "Hey, uh, what do what do you what do you guys pay?" Because they have other opportunities. So we might be able to get folks who are maybe driving twenty miles outside of our district to get paid something that we maybe could be offering them to keep them in our district, so they're not leaving. Uh, so there was a, lots of opportunities here for um, uh, helping our teachers. Uh, one of the uh, one things is uh, on this magazine article, that, which was uh, published just recently, is it says, you know, when all else fails, uh, what do you do when you can't find subs? And right now, um, the answer is you leverage existing staff, coaches, facilitators, counselors, interventionists, teachers. And so we have our teachers who are working in, you know, it's a tough tough environment with anxiety and reopening school and following up precautions. And now we're also asking them to uh, cover classes. And so, uh, and so that just adds to a stressful long day for them. And so uh, you know, there may be some more information. I'm working currently with the uh, teachers union on an MOU uh, about that. That's a separate situation, but I do think that this would really end up helping our uh, help further our sub pool and maybe help our teachers out who are doing so much already for us. Oh, go ahead. I don't think, thank you, Brian. Yeah, and uh, it, the 115 just puts us in, in a good place between the districts uh, 30 miles around us, basically, yeah. Yes, we wouldn't be the highest, we wouldn't be the lowest. We would be right, right there with everyone else. As of right now, though, we are the lowest. So we're looking to find the Goldilocks spot. Good. <laughs> um, any further discussion? Or shall we move to a vote? All in favor, please click yes. And opposed, click no. Yes, Scott. And Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, and Did I miss uh, all who are seconded? voting. Did I miss that and somebody seconded? I seconded it. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. Um, great. So uh, passed unanimously of all those voting. Uh, now, Flora, back to you. Yeah, so one, Two more things, but one especially, uh, we had a discussion on the electric vehicle charger at Romney Elementary School, and the recommendation from uh, from the facilities committee, uh, there were a couple of options that were included uh, to us. Uh, so uh, we decided on option two as a recommendation to you, but we want to talk to you uh, about it. Uh, so the recommendation is that we will continue to provide the EV unit and the electric service to the community, but the district will not pay for the assured service agreement, maintenance, cost of the network, network service costs. We will ask the town to pick up this cost. If the town refuses to pick up uh, this, uh, the, the assured, the maintenance, and the network service, uh, we will then move into eliminating the EV charger from, 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 this, from, from the school. That was our uh, recommendation. That's great. Um, are, are you putting that forward as a motion as well? 
Sure. Okay. Um, second. Second. Oh, uh, I heard Kare. Thank you. Um, so, uh, discussion of this. Caroline. I, I had a question. Um, it does not charge people to use it. Like most um, devices now, the user gets charged the electric cost. So I wasn't sure if the amount we pay is in addition to what the person using it would pay, or if this was a device we put in. I was on the board when this happened. I don't remember it at all. Um, but we put one in that doesn't charge the user, in which case I know where I'm parking tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'll, I would ask uh, Jim Garrity, our uh, tech consultant, he looked, he did a lot of work in looking into this, a lot of research and trying to get to the bottom of all this. So I'm going to turn it over to him to answer that question and any other questions folks may have. Sure, Brian, thank you. And, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't have done this without, um, you know, Washington Electric, uh, you know, um, uh, them helping out with this as well as uh, Casey was a, was a big help as we looked at this. And so um, you're correct. Uh, today, we don't charge um, for the electricity for this. We do have the option um, if we renew the service to, um, you know, to charge the user for that, for that process. And they would they would charge charge point and then we would get a, you know, we would get our, our piece of that, um, uh, of that charge. Um, so this, just to give the, I guess the whole board and, and um, you know, the constituents a little bit of background on this very quickly. Um, this was a donation back, um, you know, in the 2016 timeframe before, you know, this predates me and a large amount of the board. And it was certainly before we all came together as a school district. And so um, as part of that donation, the electric company was also involved and they kicked in the charge point cost, which is the, the cost to put us in the portal so people can know where to find our, our, um, our, um, our electric, electric vehicle um, charger. And then in addition to that, they also, um, they also have a MiFi, a, a, um, a wireless device in the unit that allows, um, allows us to, to talk to the charge point network. And so um, what we're being asked for here is to um, is now that that five-year anniversary of the Assure service, as well as the MiFi have come due, um, you know, we're being asked to, um, to, to, to take on um, the costs associated with that. And so uh, that's the motion that's in front of the board right now. One of the things we had stated in our, um, uh, in our um, presentation was that um, the electricity cost, now whether or not we extended a charge to somebody who was charging their vehicle, that's one thing, but the electricity charge, you know, the service charge would come into the, into the school district and it would continue to do so. And the reason that we made that recommendation was because it would be too expensive to break out, you know, the, the supply cost and the transport cost for the electricity as opposed, you know, they're, they're, it's just too big of a cost versus leaving it there and the minimal charge of, of, of allowing electricity to charge. And back to your, your question about, you know, could you make all those costs up if you were to split it out or, or, or what have you, you can certainly make them up if you charge, you know, somebody for that. But having said all that, you know, what's in front of the board is, you know, do we continue as is? Do we, um, do we ask the town to pick that up? Because it's not really an educational thing. Um, uh, or, or, you know, or maybe there's another deviation. So that was really what Floor was mentioning. And uh, Floor, I appreciate, you know, you did it much more simplistically than I did. So thank you for that. And, uh, and I'll turn Brian it back over to you. Just one thing, uh, Jim, uh, what, how often have people used that? It's a good question. So we had a principal um, at Romney prior to Casey that was using it on a daily basis. And so we were seeing, you know, um, you know, a couple megawatts, I think it was, that were being drawn over the course of the entire service, uh, just a shade under two megawatts um, uh, over the entire service. But since, um, you know, November of 2018, it hasn't been used once. And so, um, you know, that's a pretty telling thing. And I think it's because that principle is no longer with the organization. So, um, you know, that can play into it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Sorry, I'm still not getting why 
why we're not charging for the electricity. I know you, you gave a long explanation, but I, maybe I need a shorter one. I don't know. But I, 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 or does it not matter? Is it not no, matter? It was. It was something that was in the first five years. I think it was because it was donated. I think the decision was made. Again, this predates me, but the decision was made not to charge for it at the time. But we have the option through ChargePoint, which is the Azure service that connects yeah. us to the network. We have the option. It's our option to charge for, for the electricity or not charge. It's not being charged for today, but that's a decision that predated me. Yeah, I mean, the thing about it is that it's in a very odd place unless you work at the school, right? I, I own an electric vehicle. I have never charged it there. I, if I'm in Middlesex, I'm gonna charge my leaf at home. Um, so unless Rumney is your destination and you're gonna be staying there three or four hours, there's no reason why you would ever use that charging station as a vehicle owner. That's right. It's just in a weird place. It's not. It's not helpful. So, well, I would go to the Red Hand Bakery. That's what I would do. Yeah, I use that. That's exactly what I. Exactly correct. Uh, exactly one correct. would have to ask about the safety of the students. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think we do. We want the general public to get come up and park their cars near our schools, and, and charge their car. And yeah, you may, maybe so you know everyone in Middlesex in, in the area, but. You can't really say people that are dry, passing through can't if you if it's open to the public. That's a, that's another piece there that would have to be considered. You know, I thought that when we put that in um, to the Romney board, uh, we had limitations on that that it wouldn't be open to the public during the school day. Just I think just for that reason. And if that's the case, um, then we would have to adjust the charge point website so that we are off the grid all throughout the day and we come on the grid if, from four o'clock to you know four pm to seven am. And so mm -hmm. uh, so that would be one piece. And then the next question is, well, why are we on the charge point website at all? We, we maybe always want to hide it. you know if we're not marketing it, maybe we should never just because of the safety of students. So, you know it's, it's that you know and then it comes back to the business side of it then, which you know so, it's a, you know, there, there's definitely some decision points there, um, you know, to consider. I mean, the, um, the attached usage, um, this is very helpful because it really looks like there's no usage uh, for until you get to 2017 and 18. Uh, and then if you said there's not been any since November of when? It's November of 2018 was the last time we had usage. I think it was, if I remember correctly, November 21st, but let me just pull up the document here. It was, um, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's been just basically two years. Yeah, it just, it, it doesn't sound like it's getting a lot of use, actually. Yeah, it's 11-21-2018. Was the last use? Yeah. Yeah. On my app. So would it, would it be, would it be useful recording. just to... Would it be useful just to remind us the motion on the table so yes. that um, I was actually going to give it another. <laughs> I don't know what the motion is. Was it the first option? Go ahead, Lisa. Sorry, I just don't know what the motion is. Was it the first option that WCCUSD, WCU, whatever, would continue to support <laughs> the current blah, blah, blah? Is that what the motion is? Yes, but the district wouldn't pay. Did you have the other part? Is, so it so be one and two? Options one and two together? No. Oh, so it's no, option two. Option two. Okay, thank you. Okay. So when you say in option two, we would continue to provide the electricity service, does that mean um, we would continue to not charge for it? Yeah. For, yeah, for, for right now, it would require us to have a, se a separate meter if we wanted to check. It, we were incurring cost. So if if the town, it's just while we are in negotiation with the town. So basically what we would be doing is giving direction to Brian and his team and the future facilities director to go and talk to the town. <laughs> and, and, you know, if they're willing to pick that cost, the EV charger can stay there. If the town is not willing, there's still a cost to remove it, right? Right. But it doesn't make sense for the, uh, you know, our consensus was that it didn't make sense to to keep it if we were going to continue to 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 have this cost. 
Yeah, plus, four, if I can add one additional comment to that uh, for Jill, yeah. Jill's benefit is, Jill, I think back to your question, if if the town were to, you know, were to agree to some some level of cost sharing, then they may want to weigh in as well on recouping some of that cost, just like we would want to recoup some of that cost in, in a charging type atmosphere. But until we go down that negotiating path, if it's if that's the recommendation of the, of the board here, um, you know, we won't be able to speak to that. But I think, you, you know, your question and your, your comments are noted. And this is something that, you know, if we do, if we do um, track down that path, I'll make sure is part of the conversation. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Um, do we want to make this service available for teachers, though? Because with the Biden administration, there might be some more incentives for people to buy electric cars, and then teachers might be wanting to purchase those and have ability to charge when they're at school. So um, I don't think we should be paying for it if it's not being utilized. Um, and then I don't know what the option is. Again, there might be incentives um, in the pipeline in a few years or maybe a year, um, but to put up a solar panel to generate that electricity so we're not enduring that cost. Kind of what they have at the co-op. And Kari, I don't know if you can talk to that more about expenses and, and things associated with a solar um. panel. Yeah, I, we, I mean, we, we could talk about that maybe as an as an option if we decide to stick with it. Um, I, I think I think we should deal with the motion that's on the table. Um, just recognizing it's not getting a lot of use. Yeah. So um, I'll call the question, Chris. I have one more you, question. You, if, you're, um, sorry. Uh, I was throw, okay, Jaya. If we um, disconnect it. Can we reconnect it in like a year if a staff member has an electric car and wants the ability to charge, or would that be too expensive? I, from my perspective, sure. You know, I, I, we can leave, well, we can disconnect it, leave the electricity capped, breaker it off, and, and, and I don't think that's a big expense whatsoever. And then if we, if we decide to re-enable re it, um, I don't see that as being expensive and it might be a nice employee perk in the future. So I think, uh, I think that's a, a consideration, sure. Okay, um, have we got enough on this? Shall we move to a vote? All right, then all in favor of the motion. Um, Lisa, can I, would you mind reading the motion just to make sure one last time that we've got it straight. So I have that floor moved that WC Washington Central UUS day would continue to provide the EV unit and the electricity service to the community, but the district would not pay for the assure service agreement maintenance costs or the network service costs. We would ask the town to pick up the cost if the town refuses to pick up the assure maintenance or network service costs, WCUUSD would eliminate the EV charger and, and seconded by Kari. Great, thank you very much. Everybody understands? All right, then all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. Yes. And Chris says yes. Thank you. And all yeses. So the motion carries unanimously. Um, I should point out at this point that my internet connection seems to be unusually bad. So if it's if it gets really um, un uh, floor you to do right. Okay. I'll take that as a yes. Yeah, you can always try putting your video off, and it might help. Okay, um, I might I might just do that. Um, yeah. So uh, I think uh, back to you, Flora, for the next. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm gonna just make a motion, and then I have Lori talk about it, and we can uh, vote. I made a motion that we purchased the 2017 Toyota Sienna in the amount of $17,984. Second. 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 Second.
Sure. Um, a second. When, oh. And, and Kari <laughs> your moves, Kari seconds. Well done. Right on top of that. Okay, so now I'll speak to that. So um, we have had a recommendation after conferring with Dave Hannigan that this van has very little miles on it. We've been leasing it for three years and we're happy to report that the grant that Brian mentioned earlier is going to actually pay for this van because it's being used right now primarily for delivering meals. So I just wanted you to know that there's no budget impact to this and we just had um, honored the recommendation by Dave Hannigan and the group that this is a good van and it's, it would just be helpful to just purchase the one that we've been driving. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Is there any discretion? Any questions? Joan? Yeah, this is uh, just really quick. I seem to remember that maybe it was this year, maybe it was last year that we, did we authorize the district to purchase vehicles without board, without needing board authorization? I seem to remember that. Is that ringing a bell for? Because this is a bid process, um, what will happen is because this is also getting paid for from a grant, I do need board authorization, please. Sure, sure. Thank you. I was confused too, Jonah, so you were not the, the only one. Okay. So, yes. Great. So um, any other any other questions or, or discussion? If, let's go to a vote. All in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And I'll listen up for Chris. Yes, please. I heard. Thank you, Chris. And um, all, vo <clears throat> all votes are yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Um, wonderful. Do you have anything else on finance committee floor before we move on? One, one quick report, uh, you authorized us to to meet, to meet have that small group meet about capital and Lori and Bill Ford and myself met uh, uh, this Monday and we're planning on meeting next Monday, I believe. We just have to schedule it. Uh, so we have started the, the process. I don't have a, a big update yet, but we're looking at the possible projects for next year. And then Lori already uh, talked about uh, the, the main thing is to try to move some of that capital money, but she's still waiting from Abby from the AOE to give her authorization uh, for that. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so it's uh, 817, we're at a transition point to education quality. We've been going now, um, some of us for three hours um, and two hours and 15 minutes without a break. Do you want to take five humanitarian break and come back at 822? Okay, I'm taking that as a yes. See you back at 822. Thanks. Kari, we're at education quality. I can turn it over to you. Um, yeah, take your time, take your time. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so this month we began our review process. So very exciting. And on page 68 is the beginning of the slides that were our presentation. And just to remind everybody, we're um, working in service of our two student achievement goals this year. One of the goals is a process goal. Where we're trying to develop a system of reviewing each of the student learning outcomes. But the point of that process is to really help the board understand better our student achievement, both in the activities that we do and in the outcomes that we achieve. So um, this month, we started with financial literacy, and maybe it was helpful to start with one that's relatively smaller in scope and is um, pretty contained. Seemed like it was an easier one to maybe get our minds wrapped around a little bit. And hopefully everybody's got a chance to review the presentation slides <clears throat> and get, gives you a sense of the variety of topics that we're trying to cover within each student um, learning outcome, I believe. 
And I'm going to ask Jen to share a couple of the highlights of that presentation just to give you some uh, uh, additional detail. So, Jen. Yeah, great. So, thank you. I'm going to share my screen with you. And um, oh, it's been disabled. So, uh, Jim, can you enable my screen share, please? Let me see if I can get in there yet. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So we had talked about sharing a few slides with you um, just to highlight a few things. So the first thing that I want to do is share with you um, this presentation. is It's the overview that, um, that George Cook had provided to, to you all. And I think that what's important for you to know is that we wanted to embed some teacher and student voice in these presentations. So we're going to hear directly from George in this overview. And I know I need to share my sound with you. Let me just find that. Share computer sound. And here we go. Hi, George Cook here from U32 in our Department of Business Education talking with you today about our class in personal finance. At U32, this is a graduation requirement. I'm happy to say that U32 was a real pioneer in this throughout the state of Vermont, where at the very, very beginning, there were only a handful of schools requiring this course, and now several throughout, uh, throughout Vermont um, are on board with this project as well. Throughout the course of the semester, we cover three learning themes, spending and saving, credit and debt, and investing. And although, of course, the class does involve mathematics, it's important to note that we talk a lot with the kids about the psychology of money, being disciplined with their money, and making really important decisions. So essentially, the course is a combination of those mathematical skills, those areas of personal finance, but at the same time, just having really good discussions with the kids about our experiences, uh, both good and bad, making decisions with their money. All of our work is loaded, along with all the other work that we have here at U32 in our Canvas Learning Management System. We load them week by week, and the students throughout the course of the semester can see their work for both in-person and remote learning, and at the same time, of course, check the progress of any of their grades. Thank you. All right, so that's George. And I think one thing that I would really emphasize is that it seems especially relevant. One of the themes that came through was the real life applicability of financial lit, and especially during this time of the pandemic, um, it seems all the more relevant. Wanted to just provide a little bit of information to you about the um, proficiency-based graduation requirements and our performance indicators. So as George mentioned, we have three standards. You can see them listed on your screen, spending and saving, credit and debt, and investing. They are aligned to the Jumpstart National Standards. The Vermont Agency of Education actually adopted these standards in January of 2018. Typically, um, students at U32 take one class in financial literacy over the course of one semester, and upon successful completion, they achieve proficiency in those three standards. Another thing that's important to note is that um, we have not articulated PIs in financial literacy as a student learning outcome sort of separately, pre-K through eighth grade, but we do address a number of the concepts either through mathematics or through global citizenship, but that would be a body of work to be considered. Then the final thing that I'll highlight for you is a little bit of our student outcome data. I'm just going to quickly fast forward here and share this piece with you. And this is the, um, the data from last year by the end of the year. And I think that a few things are important to note. Again, most of our students, not all, but most of them take financial literacy in their junior year. And so you can see that the majority of our students are achieving proficiency in those standards through that experience, and some aren't. 
And I think that it's important if you preview the, um, the whole rest of the presentation, you know that we've been offering a summer learning opportunity for two summers for our kids. It's an opportunity to do two things. One is to make sure that students who need additional opportunities to reperform a little bit of additional time or experience have more time and experience. I think one thing that I'll say now and again and again is that in a proficiency-based system, achievement remains the constant and what can vary is time and place. And our summer learning opportunity is um, that variation of time and, and space or place. So that happens, and, um, and the other thing that sometimes happens is that kids in a more traditional schedule than we have this year may get called back to get additional opportunities um, right now. So that's something important. And then a few kids just hadn't taken it yet at the end of their junior year, and so they will find time to take financial it during their senior year or um, in the summer, that's creating an opportunity now for students who want to open up their schedules down the line to take financial literacy. And again, in the full presentation you saw, there were uh, two quotes from students about taking it in the summer and, and why they took it in the summer um, for that expanded learning opportunity experience. So those were the things that I was planning to highlight, and then I will pass it back to Kari for the next piece. Th thank you, Jen. So um, that gives you a, a little flavor of the kind of um, information that the committee is looking at and that um, is available. And um, we used a protocol to have a sort of a structured discussion. And in the memo that um, I, that was provided, you get you'll get some of the I guess you might say findings of the committee. Um, and, you know, in terms of the questions that this raised for us and uh, um, some of the possible implications. So our objective tonight is really it's informational. We're just wanting to share this overview with you and just give you a sense of what we're up to and, and obviously the content, what, you know, what our district is doing with financial literacy as, as one student learning outcome. I think with more time um, and more of these reviews, our theory is that the board is going to become sort of proficient in, in, in being able to use the knowledge um, of, of uh, student learning outcome or student achievement for planning and budgeting purposes. But we're just getting started now. We'll have to test that theory down the road. So I'll pause there and see if there's questions or suggestions, um, see what the re reaction is. Uh, if I may, Kari. Um, the, the presentation was great, and I also very much liked the memo um, that accompanies it. I think that was really useful, too. The, the questions that, that you came up with or that your committee came up with, very interesting and um, thoughtful. I, I appreciated those. Great. Yeah, I think um, it'll be interesting to watch that over time as we get more practice with it and we start comparing, um, you know, different aspects of different student learning outcomes. I, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be good. And I'll just take that opportunity to make a plug that any uh, board member who wants to come and sit in on um, any given student learning outcome review, you're more than welcome that we generally meet um, practice has been to meet the uh, uh, the five o'clock hour before the first board meeting of the month. So on December 2nd, we're going to be tackling transferable skills, maybe at the other end of the spectrum from financial literacy. This is going to be a pretty rich discussion. So everyone's invited. Um, come and join in. Thank you for the invitation. Um, other other uh, questions for uh, for Kari or for Jen, um, board members. Uh, Jody, do, was that it? I just want to give a shout out to uh, George and Bonnie. We learned today in an email that was forwarded to us that the U thirty two high school was recognized by NGPF, and I'll have to look up who that is as a gold standard school for financial literacy education. And that just came through today. So it'll be in the next newsletter, but it seemed like a good time to share it. Yeah, most definitely. That's that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. 
It's almost like you could have planned this. Else? It's almost like you couldn't, <laughs> couldn't plan that. I mean, it's that's just you know amazing. So, kudos to U32 and Jen. Uh, kudos to Jen uh, for educating me about the uh, student learning outcomes because uh, I think that was also a big part of it. Uh, the uh, work with the student learning outcomes that the district has been working on for a number of years. I thought Jen was very strategic in selecting financial literacy first because it's uh, you, it's easier to get your arms around that than picking a larger subject area which it can definitely get uh, uh, more challenging. So thank you, Jen. Yeah, yeah, amen. Sorry, I want to um, reach in for a minute. Am I, even though I'm a student, able to come to those reviews about student learning outcomes? Absolutely, please do. Uh, we would welcome have you participate. That's Excellent. awesome. I'm very um, into about how proficiency and everything works. So that'd be great. Fantastic. Very happy to hear it. Um, so, Kari, anything, anything else before we move on? Uh, no, I, I don't have anything else at this point. We're, we're informational. At some point, we're going to be asking you to wrestle with the. Uh, with the substance a little bit more, but we're just we're just getting our feet wet here. That's great. That's much better than being pushed into the deep end. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so then uh, we can move on to four point six policy committee. And Chris, I can turn it over to you for that. Thank you, Scott. Um, so on our agenda, we only have one. Um, a policy that is up for a second reading and adoption, and it is the Title IX policy, which is uh, is very lengthy. Uh, so, um, is there a motion to approve uh, the Title IX policy as presented in the board packet? Oh, sorry, that's that's for you to say, Scott. Uh, I'm. I can just sit back and relax, Chris. No, um, Sorry about thank you. Doing all the hard work for me. There no you go. problem. Um, but but just to echo Chris's request, would anyone care to make that motion? I'll move to accept the first reading of policy C12. I, I, I think the section might be second. Second. Second and adoption. Reading and adoption. I move to accept the second reading and adoption of policy C12. Thank you, Jonas. Second Thank you very much. Um, was that Lindy or Diane? It was. It's Lindy. It was Lindy. Um, and Lindy seconds. Thank you. Uh, so, um, any discussion or Chris, do you have further presentation? I do have some for, further comments. Uh, this is the policy that was um, given to us by the uh, Agency of Education. Uh, and the indication is that we must adopt it as is, that we don't have a Title IX uh, policy in effect, um, and we need to have one in effect. Uh, we also had discussion that since this has um, basically come down from the um, federal government, U.S. Department of Education, there is a possibility, if not a probability, uh, that it may change within uh, the next year or so. Um, because it's, I don't know if there's any knowledge, uh, well, it was somewhat in the news in terms of um, it being just a very different policy than what we've been used to. Um, and Kelly Bush, who was um, telling us that they, they'd gone through some training, uh, and it is, um, you know, it, it looks like it's a policy that does not keep um, the uh, complainants name confidential as much as what we had been doing. Um, and it's just, reading through it, it's just, it's, it's an odd mix to me of both a, a civil process and al almost incorporating some elements of criminal process into it as well. So it just, it, it sounds like it's just gonna be a much different uh, type of process than what we would, we would be laboring under um, or using under the uh, bullying, harassment, and hazing policy that we have in place right now. Mm. And um, I welcome any any correction or clarification that anyone may have on my right. on my comments. 
Thank you, Chris. Brian has his hand up. Sorry, it was, it's interesting. I was reading the uh, AASA, that's the National Organization for, like we had the Vermont Superintendent Association, also a member of the AASA, which is the national part. And they were talking about that this, the current administration uh, that, and the federal government, this is one of their, uh, probably the longest lasting legacy that they may have from the federal government in the educational policy realm. Uh, but they do think that uh, there wasn't really a requirement to have Title IX policies before. Uh, now, we, we don't have one, but now there's a requirement to have one. So we definitely need to have one. I think we're exposed in certain areas by not having a policy. Uh, and I want to thank Kelly Bushy for her leadership in uh, working on this uh, with with uh, attending trainings, be working with the Title IX uh, legal team at the state level and uh, recognizing that this may be altered and we may have to amend this policy as we move forward when the uh, new administration takes over in the federal government and as they get their arms around this uh, piece. Uh, it is a quite a rather lengthy policy. Uh, I think it's, there is a lot of work that we're gonna have to do with our uh, school-based administrators and I can let Kelly talk more about it, uh, the, but it's an it's a opportunity for us to make sure we have something on the books and be open to the fact that we may be asked to change this as we move forward. Kelly, do you have anything? No, I think what you'll notice in this policy that's different from most other policies is that the procedures are included. And typically we don't do that here. And it is the recommendation from legal counsel that the procedures do be included in this policy because there's not a lot of wiggle room and that we are required to follow the, these procedures. Thank you very much. Um, uh, certain amount to unpack here, but um, in terms of the board's decision on this, uh, are there any further questions or concerns or shall we move to a vote? Um, I'm not hearing anything, so let's go to a vote then. All in favor of uh, Jonas's motion to accept the second reading and uh, uh, to approve the second reading and adoption of policy C12, please click yes. If you're opposed, click no. And we'll hear no. from you, Chris. Yes, I'm in favor. Okay, thank you. And I'm seeing all in favor. So the motion carries unanimously. Many thanks. Now, um, moving on to board operations. Uh, we, have, um, we have Jill Olson to thank for the draft on page 101 of um, board norms. Um, why don't we have a motion to adopt um, on the table and before we discuss, would are, are, do you feel ready to do that? Silence. I think we feel would anybody fine. like to move? I, I would move that we adopt the board norms as I have presented them. Uh, I'll second that, sorry. I was, I got kicked out of the meeting. My internet is really weird. Uh, um, I, I know what you mean, Floor. Yeah. So Jill moves, Floor seconds. Approval of the board norms as drafted on page 101, the clean version. Um, discussion. Scott, would it help if I just reminded everybody what I, how I approached this? I would be delighted. Thank you. Okay. It would help a lot. Okay. So in our last board packet, you may remember we had three documents. We had the old U32 board norms. We had a document that Scott had drafted. And then we had uh, one that looked more like a, a chart that had, and I can't actually remember the source of that one. Uh, uh, Floor brought it to us, but I, I no longer remember where it came from. That from had, yeah, restorative justice from Ruth. Oh yes, yes. Okay. And so that had some other um, sort of, uh, many of them were sort of like, you know, how we behave as, as individuals. Um, what, where we landed was that we thought that the U32 
the old U32 board norms were a pretty solid starting point. And uh, we agreed that I would start with those and incorporate a few items from the other documents that, uh, that we thought made sense. So I did give you both a clean version and actually it looks to me like it's got a little bit of formatting problem because I, I did keep the, you know, I did, I did keep the uh, changes tracked. So you, you also have the, um, revi the version that's the, where you can see the revisions from the uh, U32, um, uh, U the old U32 policy. So what I tried to do, actually, I'm gonna just look at that um, was, um, we, we agreed the first one uh, just needed to be more clear about communicating to the public. So I, I just reworded it and clarified it a little bit, um, made some clarity about the opportunity for public comment um, and also how we deal with it. If something comes up in public comment that warrants further discussion, um, that gets back to my the concern I keep raising about not getting kind of buffeted by, um, by new topics. Um, I added the idea of community dialogue about um, scheduling community forums, um, just to make it clear that that's different than the public comment time. Um, and I think then um, the other uh, major item is um, that there would be uh, an opportunity for um, enough time and reflection. I was again trying to get it like not surprised, not having to deal with something hard um, in, a, in a single meeting. So that's the reflection one. Um, and I think that's, oh, and then the respect each other one, I made some, uh, that's where I incorporated some of the things from the restorative justice um, document into a kind of an existing um, bullet. Uh, oh, and I also on the role of the board, I just clarified uh, old language from U32 about staying at a high level and not being in the weeds and tried to make that a little bit more sort of what we really mean, which I think is staying on our in our policy making oversight role and not in the operational details. So I just tried to clarify that. So that was my approach. I'm totally open to changes if people have them. Um, but I thought I would take a stab at at least getting us to a single document. I think I think your stab skewered it, Joe. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's great. Um, I, I, and and uh, we, oh, we but can. Stephen turned his video on. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, is did he? Is he raising his hand? No, 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 he doesn't have, oh, he raises Oh, his okay, hand. I see Caroline and I see Steve, well, I see Stephen. <laughs> Caroline first, then Stephen. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, Jill, from the um, last meeting to this one, I think you picked up on everything that we discussed. I love what you did and yeah, I, I, oh, great. I think you got everything that we said and it looks awesome. Thank you. Great, sure. Thanks, Stephen. So I, I apologize, I wasn't here for the previous meeting. So if this was discussed and already decided, just tell me to be quiet, but um, I don't know what mindful listening is. Oh, well, you remember we did mindful listening at our board retreat, right? Isn't that, wasn't that, you know, where you're sort of like trying to be able to repeat back? I, I guess the point I bring it up is that I think the norm should be more general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, to subscribe a, a certain style of listening necessitates yeah. that board members are trained in it, new board members are, yeah. you know, it's a minor point, but if we say we make Listen. it more generic, then it, it, in my mind, it's mm -hmm. easier. And then I, I can't I can't resist the opportunity to suggest that tonight we violated role of the board. Going back to my earlier point, and I know Brian, you and I are potentially butting heads over this, but um, we got into the weeds. So the last part was just a pound of flesh for me. Uh, <laughs> 
just everyone can disregard it. It's sarcastic humor, but you know, maybe taking out mindful. Yep, and we could just say lis listening uh, uh, as the word instead of practicing mindful listening. I, I, I think that would be, maybe we'd remember what that meant better in a year. That's, I do try to write documents so that they still make sense later on. I would be comfortable with that. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> nobody would advocate for practicing mindless listening, I presume. <laughs> So, um, yeah. We don't need uh, practice, guys. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, so, uh, would you uh, would you accept that edit from Stephen, Joe? Mm -hmm. I would. Okay. Um, so, uh, I have I have a comment. If no one else is, has their hand raised yet. Sorry, Chris. I didn't catch that. Okay. I have a comment if no one else has their hand raised. No, nobody else can... that I can see has okay. a hand raised. So um, in, ter in terms of the community involvement uh, during board meeting, um, I'm, I'm not favorable to the part that says um, the board members should listen but not respond. Because that would, uh, that seems to me to say that you, you can't ask questions, even if a member of the public is making a statement or a comment that you just don't don't understand or you want to understand better. Uh, and it doesn't seem like that's something that should be put off to another meeting in the future. So, um, you know, I think we have a dialogue with our, our community members as opposed to um, a monologue going one going each way. So I would ask that that, that but not respond a phrase be taken out. So, um, but you agree that it's an opportunity for board members to listen. Absolutely. Mindlessly yeah. or not. <laughs> okay. Hopefully not mindlessly. Yeah. Um, Joe? I feel less comfortable with that change. And, and that's because I really actually feel like we public comment should be largely one way, not two way. That, uh, that's actually something I feel pretty strongly about. I think we should have forums that are two-way where, where we have agreed on that, but I have routinely been concerned that we've had public comment that has taken us off track from the agenda that we've planned. And so I, I was trying to get at that idea that we would generally, that, that the expectation would not be that we would take up a new topic because it was raised, just because it was raised in public comment in the meeting that we, we are in. So I, I guess I, what I'm saying is I kind of meant it, meant it how I wrote it. Um, may, may I try to bridge that gap just mm -hmm. for a moment? And, yeah. Um, but not respond substantively, add substantively after respond. Because I think Chris, mm -hmm. uh, Chris has a, is thinking of, you know, if, if I'm not mistaken, of asking like a clarifying question or, um, something like that, to, so as to be able to understand what the um, community member is saying. Um, right. I'm not talking about taking up a different topic or adding to the agenda. It's just clarifying and and actually asking more information about the uh, if the member of the public is asking something, asking them for more information about it. Um, and I, I agree with Joe that we shouldn't take up new items. And if there's a new item that's not on the agenda, it should go to a future agenda item. But we should be able to inquire and ask questions about and have a dialogue with the, the public. What about if their we comment? left it? Yeah, so what, so, but you're, Chris, you're not suggesting taking out the next sentence about if it were no. warrants further discussion. You agree with that one? I agree with that one just because. Um, we've had an unfortunate experience, I think, with that this year, um, and maybe every year, um, just to be able to be able to uh, to respond to, with to that new inquiry thoughtfully um, and with more discussion as opposed to on the fly. Right. What if it said public comment is primarily an opportunity for board members to listen but not respond? Would that help? 
that doesn't change anything, Jill. No? I don't think so. Primarily? No? Okay. Um, uh, no, it's, it's, it just uh, seems to me that it's saying board members cannot ask questions. No, I, didn't, I don't mean that. I definitely did not mean you couldn't ask questions. I meant would not uh, uh, be, you know, start sort of sharing our opinions about whatever the person has raised. That's what I mean. So I didn't mean okay. I didn't mean to eliminate the opportunity for question asking or clarification. So then, why don't we? Okay. What, what about this? There's opportunity for board members to listen and ask clarifying questions if necessary. Yes, I could live with that. Are you getting this, Lisa? <laughs> I hope. Yes, I am. Thanks. And ask clarifying questions if necessary. Yeah, I like that. Um, That's very Jonas specific. <clears throat> Great. Um, uh, and Jonas, and then Fleur. Um, as, as someone who violated this norm uh, a few weeks ago, um, you know, that was a situation where I thought it was, um, it would have been inappropriate for us to leave those comments unaddressed. Um, I understand that these are norms, um, um, but I am really hesitant to put a muzzle on ourselves, you know, in the, in the, in the interest of keeping meetings regulated in situations where we have an obligation to respond to someone in the moment. That's happened once in the year and a half I've been on the board. Um, and I don't want to lose that opportunity or to, you know, I don't know, inflict opprobrium on someone who feels it may be necessary to respond. Well, I would say there's no penalty for, for violating the norm. So, <laughs> Um, and I, I think they also, though, allow us to say if we start, because I've seen us get into the responding at least three times in my time on the board. N maybe not you, Jonas, but I've seen it happen multiple times. And um, so my feeling is it's just an opportunity for a board member to remind colleagues that we don't, this is how we generally do public comment. And if someone feels strongly that there's nothing that's going to stop them. But I think it's important for us to set the expectation for the public, too that unless we've said it's a dialogue, it's more of a one-way street where we're receiving information that we might then act on at another time. I'm, I'm on board with that. Okay. With, with, that, with that approach, with the wordsmithing I'm agnostic about. Okay. But, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, I felt very strongly I know that, you did. that, that night. And, uh, you know, I, yeah. that, that's all. Understood, thanks. Fleur. Oh, you're on mute, Floor. Sorry. Ask questions to understand. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah. I, it, As, it, it's, it's a little. Okay. Can you hear me now better? Yes, way better. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. My email is a disaster. Ask clarifying questions to understand. I am, I am going to live with without the mindful, but this is something that. You know, I think if that's to understand, then it's to to be there. Um, it's like a mix between the two, between Jill and uh, Floor. We couldn't really hear you, but I think you said and asked clarifying questions to understand. I think that's what you said. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mia, are you on? Um, uh, okay, uh, let's see. Um, just to take stock of where we are. Um, uh, uh, I think the, the purpose of asking clarifying questions would be to understand and yeah. um, ordinarily. So would that, would that seem to actually be uh, sufficient? Um, I, I understand what you're, <laughs> I understand what you're getting at, Floor, um, but uh, and and the but I think the purpose is implicit in the in asking the questions. 
how they're clarifying questions. Um, uh, I agree. Do you think I we can be good with that? Otherwise, good enough, uh, yeah. Yeah, and if we need to, we can always change these along the way too. But um, how, how, would, how would you all feel based, basically uh, delete mindful and um, uh, opportunity for board members to listen and ask clarifying questions in the um, second bullet. Uh, those are the two changes. Um, are, are we ready to vote with those changes? Sorry, can I clarify, Scott? What was the mindful? You may ask a clarifying question. Thank you. <laughs> um, what was the mindful piece? Did you take out that whole little phrase, practice mindful listening or? No, no. Um, well, yeah, it, it sounds dumb if we it listen. practice listening. Listen. Listen. Mm -hmm. Just listen. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. It's good. Um, okay. So practice mindful listening is going to become listen. Um, nice and crisp. Uh, are we ready to vote? with those two changes. All in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And I vote yes. Thank you, Chris. And I see all yeses. Thank you very much, everybody. And, and Jill, most especially, thanks to you for um, having taken that on. Um, okay. Next we have, we have board size, yeah, right? Um, and as I recall, uh, sorry, Brian. Did well, you I was just gonna ask Jill to, if she can send the updated uh, version over to us so we can get right it. Right now, yep, I will. Thank you. Thank you, sorry. Great. That's okay. No, no problem, thanks. So um, as I recall, and Kari, uh, I'll, I'll um, stand to your correction if I get this wrong. You suggested that we do a quick um, turn around the table, um, the virtual table, uh, pros and cons of 15, and then um, straw poll, and then small group to carry it further, depending on the results of the straw poll. Am I, am I recalling this correctly? Yeah, I, I might frame it as pros and cons of a smaller number. And thinking about the Pros change. And cons of right. Okay. Very good. But yeah, and um, just not spend a lot of time if we're not actually going to do anything. Yeah. Sounds, Sounds great. great. Thank you. So, um, so let's let's just um, blitz through this. Um, Kari, uh, would you like to go first, and then we can kind of sure. Just thanks. <laughs> I've given it a little thought. Sure. So. Um, <laughs> Pros in the came, come to mind for me, there's a sort of a democratic element of it. So more, um, more reliably be able to fill all of our seats. I think that's what's driven the conversation so far is that we have an open seat. So we want the towns to be fully represented and equitable, whatever our number is. Um, and related to that, we also would increase the likelihood of contested elections if there were more seats. And I think that is, um, you know, any one year to not have a contested election is fine, but you want in your system, I think you want contested elections so voters have choices. They can um, exercise their, their, their choice. And then some other benefits would be less time spent on recruitment and appointment if you haven't filled all your seats. And I also feel, others might feel differently about this, but I also feel like a smaller group is better able to deliberate and is e and is easier to administer and i say that based on other board experience i've had and um i really like the u32 board was seven um that's the smallest board i've ever worked for or with and and i thought it worked quite well i'm not proposing that but but um just as a as a comparison and then one last pro would be and this is minor but not nothing is that there'd be less stipend involved or you could redistribute the stipend that exists um, to better compensate the others. 
Okay, so, and then a few cons while I have the floor. Um, I think um, if you have less board members, you have fewer people by definition, by definition directly involved and that just reduces your connections in the community. Uh, I didn't like our old system with 32 board members, but one advantage it had is you had you know, built in relationships throughout the community that helped when it came for budget time and things like that. So you have, you know, as a result of that, you have fewer perspectives around the table unless you actively recruit those perspectives. Obviously there'd be more burden um, on the directors that are left and maybe that makes you less resilient in terms, in times of transition or in times of crisis. So those are, that's what I came up with. Huh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Jonas, would you like, I, I'm sort of just going to where the squares are on my screen. Um, I think Kari said it all, um, you know, you know, I, I agree that a smaller group is, um, you know, less unwieldy. Um, you know, I, you know, having said that, I don't think that our meetings have gone, you know, considerably longer with 15 people rather than 10. I don't think we've gotten less done. I don't think that we've been less effective. Um, but, but I, but I've sensed that the possibility is there. Um, I also agree with Kari that having more people, you know, involved period is, you know, is, is a good, um, that, you know, you do get more perspectives there, or at least there's the possibility for more uh, perspectives. Um, regarding compensation, um, you know, I'm of the mind that, um, that we should increase the compensation to attract more people to the board. Um, you know, and the, the, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, you know, not only has Worcester not had, you know, a third member, um, you know, since since March, you know, and I think I make up for that with all the talking I do. Um, but you know, we don't have full uh, we don't have full attendance at every meeting, um, and that seems to me to be a real real problem. I also want to thank uh, everyone who put this memo together. It's extensive and it's comprehensive and really really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, um, ditto. Thanks very much, Jonas. Diane. So again, both Kari and Jonas have said quite on point. Um, I guess my feeling would be I wasn't part of the discussion as to how we came to those numbers. Um, so I'm fine either way. I don't, um, I guess I don't, right now we're not in a panic necessarily. We're missing one member. I don't know what's going on with maybe a Berlin member, but um, I wonder if that, this is where our energy should be or if we need to just really shore up um, how we run, you know, how our meetings are in terms of sticking to norms and then continue to see about growing that. So I just, I just wonder about our energy level, <clears throat> excuse me, toward looking at this. Thank you, Diane. Um, yeah, Lindy. Can't ever find my unmute. I I thought this was a good document. I think 15 is an awful lot of people. Um, I thought 32 was ridiculous. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so I'm, I think it depends on if we're putting the work into it to get to a vote. Um, the stipend, I don't really have an opinion on. It was a voted on amount. And I, I don't do this for the money, but maybe somebody else would run for it. I don't know um, how that that affects. I don't really know without a survey to find out how I've heard people say, oh, I don't even want to take the money, but it's a voted on amount. It's not, you know, we have to take it. But um, I, I, I feel like if it was two from each town, it would be fine. And we might have the contested elections like Kari was saying, which we don't have. It's hard to get people to run. Yeah, thank you. Joe? Sorry, I was having trouble getting my mouse over to the mute button. Um, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add from from what we've heard. I thought Kari did a really nice job of summarizing the um, the pros and cons. I I um, definitely am inclined 
uh, to reducing the size somewhat. Uh, you know, I like the idea of uh, maybe town representation plus at large members as a way to kind of split the difference between having enough people to do all the work and um, not having quite, you know, too many or not being able to get equal representation from each town. So I, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, I, I, I am a little bit, I think it was Diane who just said, like, do we have the energy for this at this moment? And I, I do think that is a fair question, you know, about whether, whether this is the moment or whether we, you know, agree that, yeah, this is something we want to pursue, but maybe not quite this second, maybe not this, this year. I think that's, a, I thought that was a fair, fair point to make. So I would maybe, I guess, if we take a straw poll, split out, uh, do we want to do this ever from like, do we want to do this right now? You know, talk about timing a little bit separately from whether we, we have an interest in changing the policy at this moment. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Jill. Um, Flora, Jael, and then Chris. I, I don't think I have much to add. I like what Carrie and Jonas and Jill said. I am. Uh, one of the big things about having a, at large members to me would be to even further unify us more. So I think that having three members at large would be a really good thing in reducing the board size. I, I do want to make a comment about the stipend. I, if you can, you hear me? Okay, we're still yeah. The stipend it, to me is really really important because as you know as the parents right now we're all meeting remote so it makes it a little bit easier but if a parent needs to have daycare right if it doesn't have somebody that can uh, watch the kids while they are at a meeting for example it, it just attracts other people that do not have especially as we have to have meetings during the day sometimes that can't really afford to take that time so we we really need to diversify the you know how we all look in this not look but who we are in this board so we're accurately represent, representing our community so if we look at the demographics of our schools right now we're not representing those demographics it, that would be the the only extra i think it's worth looking at it because as everything it takes us a while to get going and it will require a vote it, we are already too late for march so this would be november so maybe it's not something that we pick up right now but we could start that small group <laughs> and give them a, a target date. It, so, cause you know, all of the legal requirements for, for properly warning all these meetings really takes about three months before we can be on the ballot. That's it. Thank you, Flora. Jaya, Chris, and then Steven. So the con that I see is you know, everyone's spoken to this, but just um, having smaller committees. Um, but I really like the idea of bringing community members in to sit on those committees, um, and you know they then they wouldn't have to sit through long board meetings every other week, um, <laughs> which would be probably we get a lot a lot more people interested in just joining the committees to help us do the work. Thank you, Jaya. Um, Chris, then Steven. So I, I would not oppose reducing the number, the size of the board. Um, I think it's always been an odd number uh, though, so you can have a, a tiebreaker if necessary. Um, and I do think it's important though to have a certain number of members from each town in the, um, in the union. Uh, and if we're going to go with 11, uh, two members from each town with one at-large member. Um, and yeah, so, and, and I actually think we could do it this year. Uh, I don't think, you know, if we still have to um, pass and uh, warn a budget, we'd certainly be able to pass and warn um, a, a, um, a vote for the communities to, to decide whether or not we want to reduce this, they want to reduce the size of the, uh, the board. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Stephen, then Jonathan. I, I have nothing substitute to add to the discussion, although I would, Chris is probably surprised I might be contrary to him. I, I think it's not something we try to do for March. Um, I, I, I agree that it would be possible 
to meet that deadline. But I just, I don't think it's something we want to put on the plate as an active discussion uh, amongst ourselves and our community members at this time. I think it would be better to spend the time and the board coming to a, a real clear recommendation and deal with it at some time in the future. Thanks, Stephen. Jonathan? If um, Jonathan, can you hear? Can you hear us? Um, Jonathan may be away from his battle station <laughs> at this point. Um, so uh, anyway, um, we can maybe do a straw poll. Who is in favor? of pursuing a change in the numbers, say, uh, whatever that might look like, but down from 15 to say 10 or, or whatever it might be, um, and turning it over to a small group to deal with that. Um, a show of thumbs would be good enough for me, for those who, um, I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing thumbs up. Oh, is that a thumb up trial or sideways? <laughs> it's at an angle, uh, indicating slight approval. Slight um, approval. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I don't see anybody uh, objecting. Do I hear uh, an objection? Okay. No, not sure. hey. <laughs> great. Um, is there anyone who is especially interested in this who would like to to take the lead in um, putting together a small group. Flora, are you, uh, are you interested in that? I, I'm interested in that just because we did the articles of agreement around that, so familiar with the language. I don't particularly want to be the lead person, but I'm happy to do the work with, with a group. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, that, that's great. Uh, yeah, I'll do it. OK, Chris. Sounds terrific. Thanks. So you'll be the point person for putting together a small group. And um, maybe we can have this, uh, even though we had our agenda meeting um, this morning for the 2nd of December, maybe we can find some space in there if you want to let us know who you've managed to press gang into your, into your band of um, articles changers. Jonas. Well, to, to Diane's point, you know, I would, I would really like to participate in this, but I don't have the bandwidth right now. Um, I mean, if we were going to do this, you know, in the summer, you know, after negotiations are over, uh, I would, I would love to participate. Um, yes, if it, I'm coming. So let, let's think about timelines. Cause when we, when we talked about this in the policy committee, uh, we were at least throwing around the idea of, of um, and this, this to take into account the staggered, um, I guess just the logistics of um, a, a reduced board going into effect was voting it one year, but the actual change not occurring for, until the next town meeting and voting. So we were thinking that if we got in this year, the change wouldn't go into effect for um, ch board change in, in terms of composition until uh, March of 2022. We don't have to do it that way, um, but in terms of um, taking into account that the community may reject it, um, it or, or if they approve it, it reduces confusion of how many seats are actually going to be open. I'm just okay. saying, I think, they, all I'm saying is there, I think there's time. Uh, depending upon whether we we're um, intent on having it take effect, well, I, I don't know. I don't even know how we do that um, without avoiding a lot of confusion of having it go into effect the year we the uh, year it was approved, if it was approved, or have it going into effect a year later. Kind of like what happened with the articles of agreement, where the articles were approved and then the board expanded the next year. Right. 
only in reverse. Right. Well, um, I, I think what we can do is sort of, um, if you want to cobble together a team, Chris, uh, from those who who are able and willing, um, and then we can just see how you can bring it back to the board and um, with some general ideas about how to proceed, and then we can take it from there. Is that is so that would, agreeable? Would, to that sounds, agreeable? sounds. Would anybody um, um, object to a uh, a subgroup of three or four, not beyond that? I wouldn't object. I'm not. That seems um, like the right number. That. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll go with three and a half. Yeah, three and a half. <laughs> okay. Somebody who's only half with it. Who isn't? Who isn't? You're, uh, you already yeah. have me, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very nice. Shall we move on then? Uh, um, Kari, I just want to um, check back with you since you were the um, originator of this idea. Uh, is this going more or less as you had? Yeah. This is great. This is, this beats okay. my expectations. We got a good sense okay. of the board, and we'll see what comes next. Okay, great, terrific. Thank you very much. All right, um, then we can move on to consent agenda. Um, and I would welcome a motion to approve the minutes of November four. So moved. So moved. Okay, so I've got. Seconded. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it was I the Preakness and the Kentucky Derby all in one. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Jonas moves and Chris seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, any discussion of the minutes? All in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. Yes. And Chris says yes. So it looks like we're... Um, Unanimous approving the minutes. Now, um, Lindy, I'm sorry. I, I have the habit of turning to you for board orders. I don't know if that's at all fair, but um, I've got them right uh, here. Except oh, that would be wonderful. When I just Thank clicked you. The unmute, they disappeared, but there they are. Um, got so many windows. I got to stop this. All right. So um, I make a motion to accept the approve the board orders in the amount of $699,634.07 and $26,406.63. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Jill seconds. And, um, I have my statutory reminder to send an email, please, to um, to the central office with your electronic signature in lieu of um, any any questions or um, or concerns about the board orders. If not, then if you're in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And again, the board orders are approved. Oh, Chris? Yeah, I'm in yes. favor. So, thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, board orders are approved unanimously. Um, personnel, we have, I believe, one personnel action to approve. Um, I have would anybody you like? Pardon me, Lindy? I have it open. Do you want me to read it? I would be delighted, please. Um, I make a motion to accept the resignation of Damian Middleton at Callis, effective June 30, 2021. Second. Second, Second. with regret. Yeah, Diane seconds with regret. Regret I share. Damien survived all three of my children and um, is still smiling. So an amazing guy. Um, 
Okay, um, any other questions or concerns? If not, please click yes if you approve, no if you disapprove. Yes. And I'm, see I'm seeing yeses and hearing yeses all along. Thank you very much, everyone. And now, finally, um, for our uh, very patient, long-suffering public, we're at um, public comments time. Um, help for me uh, just to organize this. If you're able, if you have a public comment to make, if you're able, please, to click on raise hand, um, which you get to via the participants icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, <clears throat> and, ah, um, I see Barrett Jones. Hi, you guys. Um, yeah. Great. So um, I, as many of you know, am a U32 teacher. Um, I recognize a lot of last names in the screens. This is a very interesting time that we're teaching through and we're trying to sort out a lot of different matters that are involved with um, situations that come up that are very unique to our time. Um, one of which is the planned closure at Callis Elementary. Um, really, I'm just speaking to inform the board um, and maybe uh, get you guys to just be a little bit aware of certain situations that are coming about by some of these actions. Um, let me pull up my notes. So I have a son at Callis Elementary um, and the closure at Callis is causing me to provide childcare for my son um, during the closure. Um, at U32, I teach Algebra 2 and AP Calculus. Um, so unfortunately, our options as a teaching staff are pretty limited as to how we handle our absence from work. Um, so option number one is that we use our sick time. Um, this option means that employees um, use their sick time when neither their child nor we are sick. Um, as the employer, uh, the employer pays out for sick time and needs to find a sub when subs are scarce. I saw earlier, we, you guys were talking about raising the sub pay. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, so option, option number two is the EPSL and the family emergency medical leave. Um, so once that's applied for and approved, um, if approved, the employee is paid up to $200 a day for childcare, but is unable to find suitable, safe childcare. Um, $200 a day does not cover a full time wage for myself um, and most of my colleagues. So for me personally, that doesn't remain an option in terms of covering my costs of living. So I'm I'm wondering if there are other options that could be explored in these types of situations. Um, I recognize that this is a very unique time and a unique situation in that closing the school creates a situation where I need to stay home to provide childcare for my son and Ironically enough, it is my own employer that's closing the school to, to, to make that happen. So it really puts me in between a rock and a hard place. And I'm wondering if as just an idea, informational idea, that if um, 
the district were able to cover the difference between what um, what could be paid out by the federal government and a full time wage, and by doing so, um, it's uh, let's see the the employer would save money because the employer would be paying only partially to the employee, it would be um, sub pay would still need to be covered, but the federal government would be covering $200 a day for that childcare piece. Um, and then as I'm getting paid and not using my sick time, I feel like I'm more available for my students um, if the need arises so that, that I can interact with them. So it's, I'm just publicly commenting that maybe there's some, some way that can be looked at in the future. Um, we are closely approaching the time when Callis Elementary will be closing and um, that is right around the corner. I'm sure that some other situation might occur in the future where our own employees are forced to stay home for these certain cases and um, I'm fortunate enough to have been in the district um, for uh, this is my 10th year so I've accumulated sick time and I can afford to take the sick time but I'm wondering if if a discussion is could be had for other options thank you thanks very much Barrett very interesting yeah and um <clears throat> a tough one um brian you've taken note yes uh yes yes i have thank you okay um we'll uh, maybe we can um have this uh, at least some reference to this type of issue at our at our next meeting um, uh, thanks, Barrett. Um, Keith McMartin, oh, old friend. Um, please, let's see, uh, let's see you again um, from the public side of the fence. Keith, okay, are, are you there? Can you hear? Oh, the irony. <laughs> Stop it, Jill. <laughs> uh, Keith? Is that better? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, OK. I normally have a headset attached, so I'm still trying to find that. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, what I was saying was I, I did send an email uh, to the board earlier this week that I'm, I'm sure you all saw. Um, but I just wanted to um, speak up again, I guess, and uh, express my concern about the current COVID situation and the numbers, particularly in Washington County, being as high as they are. Um, and, you know, my concern with continuing to have schools be open and wondering about, has there been discussion about going to remote learning? And is there an actual threshold for what that would look like? And, and I have seen some of the guidance um, on, you know, working with the Department of Health or, or things like that, um, it just seems sort of vague. And I guess I wonder if, you know, the plan is to wait until we have cases in the school or, um, so I'm just, I'm feeling like there's not maybe as much information as I'd like. Um, and I personally am having a hard time thinking about sending my kids to school knowing that there's so much community spread. And, and while I appreciate, you know, what we're being told is that it's not spreading in the schools, clearly there are cases that are coming into the schools at this point. 
Um, so that's sort of where I'm coming from. I think the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about is that I know we did a lot of work to prepare to be able to do remote learning. Um, so I guess I just want to point that out and, and just say, you know, I think it's something we could do. Um, and I guess I'm just kind of advocating for, you know, some more thought about uh, around that um, rather than sort of sitting back and saying, well, somebody will tell us when we need to, um, which is, I don't want to say that's what it feels like, but um, it, it does sort of seem like the Department of Health will tell us. And I wonder if it's a decision, you know, maybe we should make more proactively. So that's my piece. Thank you very much, Keith. And, and yes, thank you for your email also from earlier this week. Um, <clears throat> uh, once more, um, I guess uh, following our board norms, we're looking at um, uh, a response that is a little bit um, delayed in, in time. Um, so uh, we will have another another COVID discussion uh, update with discussion on at our meeting on the second. Um, of course, that's two weeks from now. So um, and and who knows what will happen in the meantime. But um, uh, thank you. We we we've heard you and uh, appreciate your um, your comment, Keith. So um, yeah, it's it's sort of it feels it feels like it's kind of hanging at this point um, to me, but I guess that's that's what we have to do. Um, so <clears throat> are there any other public comments that I'm missing? Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, if not, uh, the agenda shows executive session for personnel for superintendent evaluation, but um, we're uh, we're not quite we're not quite there yet. Um, Brian, um, I think we have this lined up for the second of December. Yeah, um, do we have? There's no other reason for us to go into executive session, is there? Uh, not, not at this time, no. Okay. Um, so there's yet another one that we're kind of kicking, <laughs> kicking two weeks down the road. Um, a few questions. We have the name change issue and, and has discussed the budget forum. So um, is there anything else that we need to add? No, Scott, I just wanted to let you guys know uh, Floor had to jump off. So she's not going to do her usual good deed of sending around the board orders um, for all of us to reply to. So I'm having trouble getting the packet to stay open. Otherwise, I would just do it. But maybe if somebody could start that. We could get make sure that gets done. I'll do that. Sure. Okay. Kari. I th Thank I think you. that the um the, the yeah I think that our new uh, norms call for a new standing board agenda item. That's A true. reflection at the end of each. You're <clears throat> you're right. Um. So. Uh, if there's no objection, because the board controls its own agenda. Oh, Brian, Brian, sorry. I Please. don't have an objection to that. I just wanted to say there was something else that did come up recently. I just want to let the board know about it. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Kelly Bushy presented the APR report, the annual performance report uh, earlier this uh, school year. And uh, we are a district that was labeled as in need of improvement in certain areas. Uh, so uh, one of the things that the uh, Agency of Education has reached out to is uh, 
if school districts wish to participate in the something called the SSIP, which is the School System Improvement Plan uh, process, uh, they it, it would be something that would be free to our district, and we could enter into a collaboration with the Agency of Education. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about looking into it. It's, it's something that we're exploring. Does it mean that uh, I would want to uh, commit us to it without getting some more information about it? But there could be some uh, opportunities to get some training, uh, uh, free training from the state uh, around ideas around coaching, uh, providing instructional coaching, uh, looking at our MTSS system and getting some uh, additional support in those areas without actually paying for a consultant but working with the state in collaboration. But I don't wanna commit until I get more information. And I think uh, part of the feeling is, it, it is uh, the conversation I've had with some of the folks in a district office uh, resemble very similar the, the, the conversation the board had tonight with uh, talking about, you know, do we want, is this something we wanna tackle this year? Uh, you know, that, that's one of the, it's, we have a lot on our plates, but we're also very tired right now, it's right before the uh, holiday. So it's something we definitely want to look at and uh, re and explore over the next few weeks. So this might be something I will want to add to a future agenda. Sounds great, Brian. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, so uh, if there's no objection, we can, um, we can go to the reflection that Kari quite rightly reminded us is now part of our board norms. Um, Stephen has uh, has reflected on the question: Did we remain focused on our policy making and oversight role, um, <clears throat> or did we wade into the operational weeds? Uh, Stephen has made his opinion known that we waded into the weeds. Am I right, Stephen? Correct. We've also violated the uh, norm that we're not ending on time. <laughs> Thanks for that too. <laughs> the timekeeper one of the norm, I would like to see that instituted. Yeah, um, okay, Kari. Related to that, I, I thought we Go also ahead. delved into, I thought we delved into the detail uh, too much, and, and I'd be specific about that, and this would be for the agenda team, and this is only my opinion and um, and doesn't reflect at all on our on Brian or our leadership team, but I thought that the superintendent report and the leadership team report were about an hour and a half, something like that, that we spent on that material. Lots of uh, important information there, lots of, it's always interesting but I would recommend that that be less time and later in the agenda so that we're um, fresh and at our best when we're talking about uh, the topics of our goals and our budget and, and the things that I think that are central to our work only we can do. Thank you very much, Kari. Yeah. Other, other thoughts of this? These are great. Your, your work is already paying off, Joe. Diane? Uh, so just to um, kind of counter some of that too, though, I, I hear exactly what you're saying, Kari, about it's, if, if it's informational and connective, then later on, because it does potentially take less bandwidth of our brains. Um, I guess I also feel that they're pretty important, especially during COVID time, because I can't get out into the buildings. I can't um, connect with people in that way. So especially right now, um, while it seems like a lot of information, it, it helps to, to hear, and especially the part about um, how exhausted the staff is. And so I, you know, um, I just, I think it's, it's again, it's part of that, you know, what's way one person feels flip flops to another person. So I would agree with it being later on though. Terrific. Um, anybody else? If not, I would propose a future agenda item of having a wonderful Thanksgiving next week, in spite of everything. I hope that in whatever constrained circumstances you find yourselves, that you still find uh, joy and great food and um, good wine, if that's your thing. 
So, uh, otherwise, uh, if there are no further um, comments or, or concerns, we can adjourn by consensus at 9.43. With thanks as always. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Have a good, good night, night, everybody. Good night. You too. Happy good night. Good night. Thank you.